We will also have a special order of business to hear SB 649, WESO, which we will start in just a few minutes. But I'd like to go over a few of the rules of the special order of business so that we can all be clear on the committee's expectations and my expectations as chair. First, I requested that we hear this bill as a special order with a dedicated time certain so that all stakeholders can be present, listen, and participate in the hearing. It is my hope that all of the committee members can ask the questions they need to and we can have a full discussion in the committee. With that in mind, though, I have to ask those who plan to testify to keep brevity in mind. Please do not repeat what was said by a previous speaker. If you want to echo comments of those made before you, I'd ask that you associate your comments with the previous speaker. Please also be aware that we have a lengthy agenda even after the special order of business is completed. As such, here are my expectations for the special order of business. No more than two minutes per speaker. Talking for less is actually okay and appreciated. We'll keep track and, uh, by asking speakers to stop at that two minute mark. No more than 30 minutes per side. So we'll have 30 minutes for the opposition, 30 minutes for the uh, opposition as support. The sergeants will be helping with these time limitations if need be. I expect everyone to act and conduct themselves in a professional manner. Disturbances or outbursts will not be tolerated. I wish we had time for everyone to speak as long as they want, but we cannot do that. So I'm asking everyone to be respectful of the committee's time. Thank you to all of you that are here today to help in ensuring a smooth and, pr smooth and productive meeting. I also re have a request from the EMS sufferers to turn wireless, on, uh, turn wireless on your phone off and put phones in airplane mode. With that, we'll let uh, Senator Weso begin. Um, is there any questions at this point? No. Okay. So we will be starting as a subcommittee until we get everyone here. Good afternoon, Senator. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this bill. Thank you for uh, hosting a special order of business today. I will begin by accepting the committee's suggested amendments. I want to thank you, thank you. and your, your committee for your thorough review of this bill and uh, amendments that uh, help make the bill a better bill. Uh, in a session today, uh, this year in California where infrastructure is everyone's favorite buzzword, today we have the historic opportunity to advance hundreds of millions of dollars in digital infrastructure with, throughout our state without spending a single taxpayer dollars. Infrastructure that's gonna give uh, uh, cell phone users and inter internet users much better service, much better co connectivity, faster speeds, and it's gonna provide law enforcement for gre with greater tools to help address the needs of the community in just in a faster fashion. Wireless technology today is transforming the world economy and making communities safer, healthier, and more connected. 5G is our future and California is in the midst of a wireless revolution and a race to maximize access to next generation wireless technology. It's a frank, frankly, uh, it's a race that California cannot lose. California is the global center of the innovation economy and we need to push uh, the newest technologies forward in a way that uh, is befitting the, 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 the nature and the fame of our state. According to nearly every economist, 5G wireless has the potential to be a game changer. And for California to ensure the benefits of this innovation, uh, that, uh, ensuring that they're reaching every community, we must do everything we can do to, build, uh, to promote its comprehensive build out and to do it in the most efficient and, and cost effective way. Business investment and job creation will follow. New investments will follow. New technologies will be advanced at a faster rate. In fact, 
Recent studies have shown that widespread 5G investment in California will generate billions in economic growth and billions more in savings uh, from, from, wireless, from wireless enabled smart community solutions. It would also contribute to, to lowered energy use, reduce traffic and, and fuel costs and improve public safety applications. Since its introduction, we have taken over 30 amendments, not including the set we have uh, agreed to today. Uh, this we have done to address numerous concerns, including those uh, of the chair, committee staff, local government, and the cable industry. Uh, today, uh, during this pro I mean, during this process, we have listened carefully to a broad range of perspectives. We've earned the support of hundreds of state and community organizations, including PORAC, State Sheriff's Association, and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. We've addressed the concerns of our friends from the cable industry and taken more than 20 amendments specifically to address local government concerns. Most important, we've ensured that SB 649 preserves local government's right to impose reasonable terms and conditions, including feasible design and co-location standards. It preserves local authority by maintaining enforcement, enforcement of structural and health and safety codes. It respects local regulation of time, place, and manner. It exempts historic districts and coastal zones and grandfathers all existing low, uh, <coughs> local small cell agreements. SB 649 balances the need to create certainty for the small cell investor while still pre preserving the rights of local governments and reaffirming the policy that the right of way is for the benefit of all, all of Californians, all of citizens, everyone that uh, pays into creating those resources, and they should allow, be allowed to benefit from the use of those resources when it comes to uh, a use that has, all, has become essential. Telephone service, wireless service, internet service has become essential for people in a state like California to, to get access to education, to get access to job, uh, information that uh, relates to their health, their public safety, this is information that has become a must. And those public resources have become more valuable than ever for people of the state of California to get access to a better quality of life. And we're asking you uh, to support what has become a very reasonable bill in assuring that there is balance of, of everyone uh, involved in, in achieving our goals, but at the same time, it's an essential bill to make sure that we unroll this uh, extremely important technology for California's future. We have some uh, speakers in favor here today that would like to uh, share some comments as well. With if the you don't mind, we'd like to take a pause. We have a quorum here, and okay. I'd like to have the um, secretary take the, the roll so we can make sure we can move forward. Thank you. Aguiar Curry. Here. Aguiar Curry here. Waldron Bloom. Here. Bloom here. Caballero. Here. Caballero here. Gonzalez Fletcher. Grayson. Grayson here, Lackey, Ridley Thomas, Vopel. You. Vopel here. Gonzalez. Gonzalez Fletcher here. Thank, thank you very much. If you'd like to continue with the, the support. Our presentation, yes. Madam Chair, members, uh, Steve Carlson for CTIA. We are the National Trade Association for the Wireless Industry and sponsor of uh, SB 649. This next generation of wireless technology will vastly improve the delivery of critical public goods and services such as education, public safety, health care, economic development, job training, be the backbone for smart communities, and many more applications that aren't yet invented. Uh, the next generation will rely significantly on the small cell technology that is the subject of this bill. California was the epicenter of the last internet services resolution and can and should be the epicenter of the next one and robust, robust wireless networks will be its foundation. Yet unlike other important infrastructures such as roads, electricity and water, to name a few, that are financed by taxpayer dollars, the wireless network is completely private investment from the purchase of the wireless spectrum to the build out of the networks city by city across the United States. My colleagues will go more deeply into that. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is to, uh, because of a lot of the rhetoric we've heard, um, uh, both in advocacy and in the press, uh, much of it we would suggest uh, perhaps a little overheated, I thought it makes sense early in our testimony to go over what the bill does and doesn't do and point members to those sections of the bill. 
SB 40, 649 must comply with all applicable federal, state, and local health and safety regulations, including the ADA. Page 4, lines 38, 39, page 5, 1 and 2. Cities may require, both in and outside the right-of-way, building permits, encroachment permits, or their functional equivalent, including compliance with the public utility codes, the long 7901 and 7901.1, the long-standing code sections governing infrastructure and their right-of-way. And the permits may require all of the following. Compliance with feasible design and co-location standards, the first of three times that appears in the bill. Compliance with FCC radio frequency standards, conditions that you can't squat on a pole, in other words, not use a permit, and if you're not using it, you must remove it at own cost if not using. Your two minutes is up. I apologize, but and you had a lot of good things to say. We'll move it on to okay. the next support. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you have someone that would like to finish up your speech. At the uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'll talk as fast as I can. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Devine, and I represent AT&T. Thanks for the opportunity, and I'll try not to be duplicative. Obviously, we're supporting SB 649. Uh, we believe small cell infrastructure is a matter of statewide importance. Innovation in wireless technology is proceeding at an exponential rate. You just heard that from the other two witnesses. This is the year of infrastructure. You heard that from the other witnesses. And this is the only infrastructure. We are the only industry that will knock on your door and say, we'd like to invest $2.5 billion in the next three to four years in new infrastructure, new wireless infrastructure throughout California. So we believe that this is an incredible opportunity for the state of California. We are not here to ask for a government subsidy. We are not here to ask for a, ta a tax break. Rather, we believe this bill advances the deployment of this new technology in, in ways we have not uh, previously seen. First, the bill ensures small cells are subject to the same proven permitting system that is already in place for wireline technology today. Second, the bill secures access to city infrastructure, such as streetlights, on reasonable terms and conditions. This legislature in 2011 adopted legislation that required municipal-owned utilities to open their poles up uh, in a same similar manner. This bill extends that model for both private and municipal owned utilities to <clears throat> for city owned vertical infrastru infrastructure to be available in the public rights of way. And finally, it does establish a fee mechanism for full cost recovery to local government, including rents, and provides for an additional charge of $250 for each small cell attachment. So let me close because I think I'm getting close to the end here. So I believe, we believe, we have the opportunity to accelerate the build for the next generation of wireless networks now. With Thank these, you, Mr. Devine. And we're done. <laughs> I told you I was going to be tough. <laughs> you are tough. <laughs> Go ahead, Rudy. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Rudy Reyes, and I lead public policy and legal for the Western United States. Um, a lot has been said already, so I'll, I'll cut to the chase. This legislation is absolutely needed this year to address exploding consumer demand that is occurring right now and to lay the groundwork for fifth generation or 5G technology, which will provide gigabit level connectivity, high capacity, and very low late latency. You've heard the industry is in a fierce competition to be the first to launch 5G commercially. Verizon, of course, hopes to be the first, and we're already launching pre-commercial trials in 11 cities in nationwide, including right here in Sacramento. To meet this explosive demand, the industry is constantly investing in building, upgrading, and expanding the speed and capacity of our networks, using the latest equipment and technologies to keep pace with consumer demand and to build the groundwork for tomorrow's growth. One of the most important technologies to meet this demand are small cells. These are antennas that are small enough to mount on a street light or a telephone pole and are designed to blend into the background and these small cells help add capacity to, to today's 4G LTE networks. In addition, they are critically important to enable the next generation of networks, 5G, which in large part will use higher frequency spectrum than traditional cell towers. However, this higher frequency signal doesn't travel very far, likely only a couple of hundred feet, and requires a clear line of sight. 
So we are going to have to engineer, construct, and install thousands of small cell antennas throughout California to launch 5G. But existing permitting processes developed for large macro towers and exorbitant pole attachment rates uh, demanded by some cities, including the city of San Jose, which demands up to $14,500 per pole, serve as a barrier to investment. Thank you very much for your testimony. Do we have any others that want to speak in support? For those that would like to come up, they can speak at the table. You have two minutes, or you can speak right there. That's even better. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I'm Great. Susan Lipper. Yeah. Getting taller and taller on behalf of T-Mobile. In support of the bill, in support of the demand our customers expect from us, and in support of the future technology, we need a wide highway not a two-lane highway to make your phones work better and services to be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Greetings, Madam Chairman and Committee. I'm Dr. Jim Cooler with the California Center for Youth Development and Health Promotion, working with young people in 50 of our 58 counties. They are on the leading edge of technology and need the support of a broader network and a faster one. Ask any 12-year-old. So, thank you. Thank you. Kirk Johnston. Um, I'm executive director of the Solano Community College Educational Foundation in Solano County and portions of uh, Yolo, which includes Winters, of course. Um, I'm, I represent essentially uh, 13,000 students in Solano Community College, and I know our students um, are always pushing uh, for technology. As a matter of fact, the college is investing $190 million in new technology, much of it in science, uh, everything from aero, from aero to bio to whatever it may be, even auto tech. So technology is at the cutting edge of education, so that's why we're in support of this. On the flip side, though, I had a 30-year career in municipal planning, economic development, and public real estate um, in four different cities in California. Part of that role for a number of years was to actually negotiate um, cell tower agreements, and they were extremely difficult. Um, the city would get maybe twelve, a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month, so it was a significant amount. But if you could imagine taking those standards and having to negotiate each and every poll across the entire state, so from my standpoint as a planner, I'm also saying permit streamlining is really, really important. So I support the concept of the bill. I'm hoping that the parties are able to work it out because I know there are legitimate concerns about how this would, would be carried out on a daily basis. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to work that out. I don't want to speak on the benefits of, you know, the behind the scenes. Um, I'll let you work that. But it is really cr critical that we be on the cutting edge and get this technology in place. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Brenda Palomino here with Sprint. I'm pleased to be in strong support of this important measure. This measure is about certainty and predictability in the process for the responsible deployment of these um, of this technology for the benefit of our, of our consumers. So we respectfully ask for your support in this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, hello. My name is Phil McDougall. I'm the director of St. John's Program for Real Change, and we strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mark Lester. I represent the Lincoln Area Chamber of Commerce in Placer County and also the El Dorado County Chamber of Commerce in El Dorado County. And we are in support. We think this is good for business. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergei Tarabkov. I'm president of Slavic American Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here to support SB 649 uh, because it does promote um, new technology and helps to streamline uh, 5G and um, this is going to be helpful for our business members. And we represent statewide organization. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Garcia. I'm the president of NARAP, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. And we have different educational events in different counties, Yolo County, Placer, and here in Sacramento. And um, 
We support SB 649. Um, one of the reasons is that studies have shown that the homeowners are now looking for internet access, and if that access accessibility is not there, then they that, that it's making them to decide not to purchase the home. So we will ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cherry Flanagan from Society for the Blind. Uh, we are serving Sacramento region and Northern California, and we are strongly supporting this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Madam and Chair. My name is Francisco Medina. I represent the Sacramento Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, and we represent Yolo, Yuba, uh, Sacramento, um, Placer, as well as El Dorado and um, Sacramento. And we support SB 49. We hope you can as well. Hi, my name is Kathy Rodriguez. I'm the President and CEO for the Sacramento Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here on behalf of our organization in support of SB 649. Our membership does cover the counties of Sacramento, Yolo, Yuba, Placer County, and I know that this would be really good for business. Everyone always wants the faster technology and be equity for all. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Moira Top here on behalf of Orange County Business Council in support. Good afternoon. I'm President. Uh, Kim Reinhelder from Escaton Foundation, and we are located in 19 counties across California, and we support this bill. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eric Harris. I represent the NAACP of California, and we support this bill. Hi, my name is Cassandra Jennings, and I'm president and CEO of the Greater Sacramento area. We serve the six-county area here, as well as we represent the Bay Area young professionals. Um, I am here. We serve underserved communities. We work for economic vitality uh, for minorities and communities across Northern California through jobs and economic development. We support this bill, and we urge you to do the same. Thank you. I am Bob Pepe, Bob McPherson. My name is Bob Benson. On behalf of the California Disability Community Action Network. On behalf of the California Disability Community Action Network. We trust members throughout the state of the county. Which has members throughout the place everywhere. With um, advocate members everywhere. And we support this bill. And we support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And my name is Casey Dillard, and I'm here on behalf of the California Person-Centered Advocacy Partnership, a partnership of, a partnership of statewide disability advocates and families, and also on behalf of Choices Person-Centered Services that provides services and supports to people with developmental disabilities, here in strong support of SB 649. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Olga Ivanikov. I am the executive director for Council for Cross Cultural Affairs, an organization that um, represents Russian speaking Californians. We are a statewide organization and we strongly support this bill. Hello, I'm Sergey Ivanikov, CEO of Russian American Media. We're serving Russian Americans instead of California and we're supporting this bill. My name is Gary McDonald, I'm the Executive Director of Lighthouse Counseling and Family Resource Center, and also, also recently appointed to the Economic Development Council for the City of Lincoln in, support, in, in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Julie Bornhoft, I represent Weave that serves Sacramento County, and we are in support. Julian Kennedy, Policy Director, Sacramento Asian uh, Pacific Chamber of Commerce. We represent small business, Asian and small businesses throughout the six county region of Sacramento, Yolo, um, Yuba, Sutter, El Dorado, uh, Placer, and support. Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Obeck. I'm the CEO of APAPA, Asia Pacific Islander American Public Affairs. We are a national and a nonprofit organization, and we support the bill. Thank you. 
Kevin McKinley with Cal Chamber in support of the bill. Thanks. Jay Calcano with the Urban Corps of San Diego County in support. Argelia Leon on behalf of Latin Business Association representing thousands of business throughout Southern California in support. Hi, my name is David Demers. I'm the executive director of the Sacramento Regional Conservation Corps. We serve 18 to 25 year old young men and women from the most disadvantaged communities in California from here from Sacramento to the Oregon border and to the Nevada border. Um, our primary or our use primary access to the internet is through wireless service and we are in strong support of this bill. Catherine also Scott, Rosen Crown Castle, uh, an infrastructure provider in support. Roxanne Gould, representing the Wireless Infrastructure Association in support. Good afternoon, Chair and members. Lori Kammerer, representing the National Association of Women Business Owners California and Small Business California in support. Laura Bennett with TechNet in support. Dennis Albiani, on behalf of TrackPhone in support. Diane Rogers. Um, President and CEO, Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce, 450 members, 15,000 employees who all need this service. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Usha Machler on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association, representing the 58 elected sheriffs in the state of California in support. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, Tony Gonzalez on behalf of the California Historical Society in strong support of the bill. Thank you. Nancy Marish with the Congress of California's seniors in support of this bill for the benefits it will bring to California seniors and their caregivers. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, Henry Contreras with the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, representing 21 independent living, independent living centers that provide service to over 100,000 people with disabilities every day. We're in strong support of the bill. Madam Chairman, members, Aaron Reed representing PORAC, 69,000 members of law enforcement, the largest organization of its kind in the country, and uh, we represent the local deputy sheriffs, police. Public safety is critical. This helps public safety and the public immensely. We're here in strong support. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bless Shepard representing the California Asian Pacific Islander Chamber of Commerce in support. Good afternoon, Tim Spangler. I'm the board chair for the uh, Sacramento Black Chamber of Commerce. Support. Chris Rosa on behalf of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group in support. Is there anyone else in support? <coughs> Seeing none, we will move on. Are there witnesses in opposition? And I hate to be the one with the hammer, but just remember we have two minutes. I'm sure you can do it nice and quick. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for considering my thoughts. Uh, my name is Sam Licardo. I'm the mayor of the city of San Jose, the 10th largest city in the United States and the largest city in Silicon Valley. And hopefully the committee has received the letter that I submitted along with uh, the mayors of six of California's largest cities, LA, San Francisco, Oakland, Long Beach, and Santa Ana, opposing this bill. We're joined by Fresno, Bakersfield, and 150 other cities throughout the state. One thing this bill has done has unified our state uh, from the coast to the valley, uh, north and south, urban and rural, in opposition. Uh, we are opposed for a simple reason. This bill forces local taxpayers to subsidize large telecom corporations with infrastructure that our taxpayers paid for. And it does so to the detriment of the public, particularly in our efforts to broaden digital access for low-income communities. Madam Chair, when you served as the mayor of Winters, you won statewide acclaim for your success in negotiating with telecom companies to enhance broadband access in your own community. SB 649 would undermine the ability for me or any other local official to do just that. Uh, by losing the ability to have any discretion, we can't negotiate public benefit. Cities like San Jose are relying upon revenues from private sector leases on street poles, uh, whether for traffic signals or street lights, to fund efforts to expand digital access in poorer neighborhoods where the telecoms currently do not invest. In exchange for this massive public subsidy, 
uh, to the industry. The bill does nothing to ensure that lower costs are actually passed on to consumers. It does nothing to expand digital access to rural or low-income communities uh, where the telecoms are not investing. It does, however, allow corporations to preempt the use of public infrastructure for public uses, such as for public safety communications or traffic safety devices, due to the constraints on electric power, space, and signal interference on individual poles. It also allows the state to protect corporations from competition by fixing prices below a market rate. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Vasquez. I, too, Madam Chair, want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I don't think I could have said it any better than, than the mayor did. It, it, I, it, and you did say to us, listen to what the other speakers have said. And you have to ask yourself that question. Why is the industry willing to spend so much and say that it's not taxpayers' money? Well, it really is. It's, a, it, it's the right to use what is already the public's. And I find that somewhat alarming. I don't think anybody in this room is against closing that digital divide. We, as a nation, need to have that superhighway. And so for, so for that, but there is a process. We live in a civilized society, and there are rules within the society. In the communities, I have a right to say where and how these things are placed. Not an industry that's allowed to ride roughshaw over this. We saw this with the railroad. The robber barons have been gone, I thought. But to, to allow an, an industry to have essentially free reign is what I find troubling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Chair and members, Greg Cook representing Northern California Power Agency. We are an association of Northern California cities that own and operate their own electric service. We are not here to oppose innovation or technology. We're here to be sure that the local permitting responsibility uh, of, of those cities that have their own electric service uh, are, are not impaired. We first, our first number one choice is obviously safety of the community. Number two, the reliability of electric service. The bill in its present form presents some real problems. On page six of the bill, it states that nothing, notwithstanding this section, uh, certain things could happen. Yet on page 11, an amendment that the author uh, provided for us says that the local government's uh, safety and reliability responsibilities are first. So the primary problem is the word notwithstanding. We need to be sure that we provide reliable and safe electric service to our communities. That's what we're trying to correct. In the bill, it allows for small cells to be strung on wires between utility poles. Now, that's wrong. What if somebody wants to put a, a small cell on electric wire? They'll be electrocuting themselves. That service isn't going to happen. We're also concerned about access to utility infrastructure. Specifically, it says that we would have no control over public easements for our facilities. Very serious problems. Members, I urge you to please consider the safety and reliability of the, tele of the electricity system in California and be sure that the local governing bodies that oversee these agencies, these departments, have the authority to implement their responsibility. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on. Oh, excuse me. If you'd like to begin, we're on two minutes. Let's go. Yes, right. Justin. Uh, pull the microphone down. Hello, my name is Justin Stephan and I am 10 years old. I want to speak up to ask that you vote against Senate Bill 649. Right now I will tell you the story of how wireless radiation affects my life. We started to get familiar with the dangers of wireless radiation when I started taking French lessons at Mitchell Park Library. On the second floor where I took my lessons, there are seven wireless routers on the ceiling and many people using wireless laptops. It was there that I felt like a volcano was erupting in my heart. My mom took me to the doctor and he did several tests on my heart. He said that everything was normal on my test so he could not explain why I have my chest pain, but this happens every time I go to Mitchell Park Library and even sometimes at school where we have wireless routers in the classrooms. We need to stop SB649 or more kids just like me will get affected. Thank you for listening. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay. 
Welcome. Hello, my name is Dr. Ann Lee. I'm here to speak in opposition to SB 649. I attended medical school at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio and completed residency at Loma Linda University Medical Center in Southern California. Would you mind speaking up just a little bit so that everyone can hear? Sure. Thank you. Uh, where I did my research and published papers in traumatic brain injury. Afterward, I accepted an academic position with Stanford Medical Center and was attending of the Polytrauma Traumatic Brain Injury Unit at VA Palo Alto Healthcare System, where I continued my research in traumatic brain injury. My recent focus has expanded to inc include tr treatment of neuromuscular pain and chronic inflammatory syndromes. As a medical doctor, I have read peer-reviewed papers and other studies from within the over 20,000 well-established scientific studies on the bioeffects of radiofrequency microwave radiation and do testify that microwave radiation, such as that from the wireless facilities to be deployed by SB649, have been shown to cause neurological damage, cardiac dysfunction, reproductive harm, immune compromise, and cancer. Our body's function is dependent on the cellular electrical stability of its organs, and this bill would maximize California residents' exposure to high-intensity electromagnetic wavelengths that are foreign to the body. Therapeutic radiation, such as pulse modulated electromagnetic frequencies used for medical purposes are dose and time limited for a reason because prolonged exposure will cause more harm than good. Exposure to microwave radiation without, consent, without cessation while lacking consent and contrary to the will of the people will harm everyone in violation of the protection of safety guaranteed by the California Constitution. To vote for this bill would be making a grave mistake. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I believe we have a couple of phone in testimonies. Um, are they ready and available on the phone right now? Yes, I can call them right now. Let's call those two in. Um, and I'm sorry for the wait, but we do, we have made some accommodations. Hi, Nina. Yes. Yes, this is Paul McGavin. We're here, and the assembly is listening, and they're all paying attention. Thank you for starting. I'd like to remind you, please, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Is my voice coming through clearly? Yes, yes. it is. Okay, fine. My name is Nina Beatty. I'm moderator of Wireless Radiation Alert Network, and my website, Smart Meter Harm, carries research and reports on wireless technology, including economic impacts. I'm disabled by electromagnetic sensitivities. This disability was recognized federally in 2002 and affects growing numbers of people. The state architect's office helped to develop U.S. Access Board guidelines for accommodating those with EMS. New amendments have made SB 649 worse. It now permits broadband over power lines, also known as power line communications, or PLC, and preempts local control. PLC effectively turns all electrical lines and wiring into cell towers. The Austrian Medical Association and over 1,500 Swiss physicians opposed PLC when it was mandated for smart meter communication, saying this constant radiation everywhere would cause the disabling effects of burnout syndrome, including cellular stress, free radicals, mitochondrial dysfunction, and inflammation. Physician Yvonne Gilly, a Swiss, Swiss MP, asked her government, how high do you estimate the economic costs as a result of the increase of multi-system diseases in area-wide introductions of smart grids which operate with GSM, WLAN, or PLC. This bill also now permits any cell tower in the public right-of-way. Cell towers routinely exceed the FCC exposure guidelines and there is no policing. You are asked to approve cell towers outside people's bedrooms with no guarantees of safety, yet the state constitution protects safety. This bill is discriminatory, violates ADA, and erects insurmountable access barriers to homes and communities of those with EMS. It violates PUC 7901, incommoding the public. Industry hopes you'll vote fast and won't look behind the curtain of hype. The legislative analysis says fiscal effect unknown. The bill keeps growing, but this committee is given no indication of cost to state or local government. You're just asked to pass it. There's no analysis of fiscal impacts on taxpayers. 
I ask you to reject thank, thank you very much for your testimony violates federal and state laws and I request the ability testimony. to put documents thank electronically you. into the public Anita, record thank you very much thank you Sherry, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, great. I'm sitting here with the assembly, and we're going to just let you know we're in an environment with 2 million microwatts per meter squared at the table here, which is a <laughs> extreme hazard. So I wish you could please start. You just cut into some of her talking time. Thank I you very apologize. much. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Noonan. I'm a licensed psychologist. I grew up in California, and I've lived in Piedmont, California for the last 20 years. About three years ago, I developed the physical condition, electromagnetic sensitivity, or EMS, an environmentally induced illness and a federally recognized disability. I have severe migraines and other severe symptoms only when I'm exposed for any length of time to wireless microwave radiation, such as from wireless devices and infrastructures. My symptoms are unrelenting until I recover in an environment that has no microwave radiation, including signals radiation from cell towers. The way I remain alive and functional is that my home is primarily, uh, excuse me, my home is free of wireless microwave radiation. I now work primarily at home and I recover at night by sleeping in a wireless free environment. More than a million Californians have EMS, but it is not only people with EMS who are harmed. Everyone is. There are over 25,000 studies showing adverse effects of microwave radiation on the health of humans and animals, over twice as many as the 10,000 studies showing adverse effects of lead. This is why the International Association of Firefighters successfully lobbied to stop cell antennas from being installed on fire stations. It's completely clear the radiation intended to be deployed under SB 649 is a hazardous agent, and such a hazardous agent is specifically prohibited by the California State Constitution. Californians believe in science. They'll thank you for becoming educated on this subject and believing the science. There are safe options available, like using fiber optic to homes. AT&T has already been paid to do this. If you allow cell antennas to be installed near my home, I would be forced out of my own home. It would create an access barrier to my home and violate right. the American with Disabilities Act. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you thank you very Appreciate much. That. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Josh Hart, director of the grassroots organization Stop Smart Meters. Through my work over the past seven years, I have helped thousands of people whose health suffers from exposure to RF microwave radiation, a toxic agent that causes disease and death. We strongly oppose SB 649. This bill threatens to disrupt the traditional, long-standing, and constitutional role that local governments play in the planning process. SB 649 would unleash the wireless industry to do as they please, virtually unregulated. It would cost Californians dearly in rising health care costs, privacy breaches, reduced property values, and growing carbon emissions from always-on wireless infrastructure. If SB 649 passes, Big Telecom would claim the legal right to install wireless cellular sites practically anywhere, on power poles, outside our homes, in neighborhoods, public parks, and on bus stops, without any notice to residents or adequate compensation for local governments. We would all be exposed to high-frequency microwave radiation in close proximity and involuntarily. This would affect everybody's health, drive those with electromagnetic sensitivity out of their homes, tear communities apart, and push endangered species past the brink. Despite the failure of AB 2395 last year, AT&T continues to threaten the safest and most reliable communications network we have. Our analog landline telephone service works when the power goes out, unlike inferior alternatives. 
Millions of Californians depend on our landlines for basic quality connectivity, access to 911 without the unsafe wireless exposure. No matter the outcome of SB 649, this issue will be fought in the courts, at the ballot box, and in the streets. If people wake up with pulsing high-frequency 4G and 5G microwave transmitters outside their bedroom windows, their homes inundated with RF radiation making them sick, they will not be happy. Californians will ask who thank voted. You. I'm wrapping thank up. Thank much. you. I'm wrapping thank up. You. Californians will ask who voted for SB 649, the legislation that forced this unwanted hazardous equipment into their neighborhoods. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Um, if you don't mind, if you, the three here could clear so we can get three more people to sit down just so I can keep it going. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me all right? My name is Paul McGavin from Scientists for Wire Technology. I represent one to four million Californians. The estimate of what are electromagnetically sensitive people, that is a federally recognized disabled characteristic. These people will be forced out of the homes if any of these small cells plus the refrigerator size, 35 cubic foot power supplies are allowed to go any closer than 2,500 feet to their homes. We provided specific amendments to make sure that these do not go into residential areas because that's what would force people out of their homes. This is only appropriate for commercial areas and only appropriate with power supplies that are right-sized to the job. They are supposed to go 500 feet down the block. In Palo Alto right now, we have measured over 1 million microwatts per meter squared on the sidewalks from the 4G antennas that were put there in November 2016. That is 60 times higher than the Soviets beamed at our embassy personnel in Moscow from 1953 to 1968, killing three of our ambassadors, two from brain cancer, one from leukemia, two on the job, one at home. In addition, we had miscarriage. We had fatigue, we had absolute migraine headaches, we had blood problems, neurological problems, all very common symptoms of microwave radiation sickness. That is what these one to four million people are experiencing. We are electrical. We have 50 of these books being handed out to, this is called The Invisible Rainbow, Arthur Furstenberg, 2017. It will explain to you how exquisitely electrical and connected human beings are to their environment. This is the worst air pollution you can imagine that you're creating in residential zones, which is illegal and unconstitutional according to the state of Ohio, which vacated a very similar bill a week ago. They said specifically that the small cell bill is unconstitutional. The uh, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment is granted, and the cross motions by defendants are denied, the reason being it's unconstitutional. And that is in the books. That one's already gone. This is what's going to happen to SB 649 if you vote through this thing. Thank you very much for amendment. your testimony. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, please. And uh, if you'd like to come up to sit here, or if you want to go to the top, either way is fine. And just as a um, just a pause here, let's remember is that we have two minutes, and if you can pro uh, be a brief, if not to repeat what others have said, that would be very helpful. Welcome, Supervisor. Thank you, Chair Aguilar Curry, and I want to um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today in opposition of SB 649. My name is Erin Hannigan. I'm Vice Chair of the Board of Supervisors for Solano County, and I can't agree more with the previous speakers in opposition. And with all due respect, Senator Hueso, let me begin by saying that SB 649 would give a multi-million dollar handout to the world's largest telecom companies while taking millions from local budgets for police, fire, and other key services. SB 649 would give the wireless giants virtually limitless ability to install antennas, wireless boosters, and whatever they want, wherever they want, on any publicly owned streetlight, traffic signal pole, or any wood pole with electricity, cable, or telephone lines attached without any local input. This bill subsidizes the private sector with below market rates for the usage of public assets paid for by city residents. This bill voids the existing deals on the books with various cities around the state, adding millions to telecom company profits. This bill does not require telecoms to spend money on expanded wireless access for the underserved communities, one of the stated reasons for this bill by proponents. And Chair Aguiar Curry, SB 649 will not guarantee access to broadband, nor will it increase access in your district where it doesn't exist today. 
today. The reality is 5G technology will not be available for years. The truth is that telecom site selection and local permitting processes has not deterred the industry from growing as demand for new technology has grown. I support new technology for all the reasons stated by the author, and I support working with the telecom industry to place their networks in locations that work, but not at the risk of carte blanche equipment placement without local government control. Please stop the big rip ripoff of SB 649 and oppose this bill. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. I am Supervisor Kim Dalbovan from Calusa County, and I'm here representing the rural county representatives of California as well as the Calusa County Board of Supervisors. I'd just like to let you all know that we voted unanimously at RCRC to oppose this bill. Living in a broadband, unserved, and underserved area means that we have difficulty in, in acting in, in attracting industry into our already economically challenged areas. In addition to lacking access to staple internet in schools, public libraries, not to mention that we lack telehealth as well. In short, the 35 rural counties of the state are heavily interested in bringing broadband to our communities. But that is not what this bill does. Let me say that again. SB 649 does not bring broadband to the rural communities. This, does not, this bill does not increase deployment in rural areas, and in fact, it provides a perverse incentive for wireless carriers to continue building in urban areas. The reality is for our rural communities, we continue to fall behind as the digital divide increases. SB 649 does nothing to solve that problem. In fact, this bill creates other community concerns by removing any ability for local government to generate revenue from the lease of taxpayer-owned property. By taking away a source of discretionary income, this bill will impact local programs such as police, roads, and social services. The cost of this bill to our communities, to your communities, Chair, is too much. There is no urgency in getting this bill done. We ask that you respectfully, that this committee respectfully holds this bill so that a holistic, inclusive, and substantive conversation about broadband deployment can occur, not only for the urban communities, but for the rural as well. Thank you. Welcome. Madam Chair, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Don Saylor. I'm a Yolo County supervisor, and I want to share with you that Yolo County yesterday voted to oppose six, SB 649. In doing so, we joined 31 other counties, from Inyo to Del Norte to San Francisco, Kern, and Los Angeles, as well as the, the statewide CSAC board has also opposed this bill. As local governments have a responsibility to protect the quality of life for our residents, to ensure public input and in decisions that affect our communities, and to protect the public's investment in infrastructure. SB 649 interferes with each of these core local government responsibilities. And it would also remove a tool that we have to expand broadband in underserved areas. Recently in Sacramento, an agreement between Verizon and the city resulted in free Wi-Fi available in communities because they could have that as a condition of allowing these small cell tower locations. Under SB 649, counties will no longer have the ability to hear public input on the location and design of small cells. The antennas could be installed just outside of constituents' homes or in communities that have invested in improved infrastructure or aesthetics by undergrounding utilities. They could also be placed on public buildings, uh, such as iconic water towers. Communities in the coastal zone and registered historic districts would retain their discretion under SB 649. Underprivileged inland communities, such as much of the area of Yolo County, would not have that same discretion. That simply seems unfair. SB 649 limits the rents local governments can charge a wireless company for use of local traffic signals or streetlights. Therefore, it is clearly a subsidy. It isn't a free public access. Some local governments have been able to negotiate leases upwards of $3,000, while others have negotiated free access, as I've mentioned. Despite the significant public subsidy, the bill does not impose you, any requirement. We ask that you send this bill back. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Brent Cooper. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of American Canyon, located in the proud District 4, of which Chair Aguiar Curry is our representative. I'm here representing the uh, City of American Canyon City Council. Um, the City Council is strongly opposed to SB 649, uh, primarily for aesthetic reasons and the loss of local discretion on aesthetic installations. Uh, American Canyon is happy to participate 
in any stakeholder group discussion on how a ministerial system could be put in place that protects local aesthetics. And um, we are willing and happy to participate. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. I'm Mayor Laura Hoffmeister, Mayor of the City of Concord, and Concord is an Assembly Member, Timothy Grayson's district. Uh, today, I want to share with you that along with the League of California Cities, the City of Concord is also opposed to this bill. It was mentioned earlier that it does not help in the digital divide. It allows cherry picking of the industry for their deployment of the services. It also does not have cumulative limits on the ancillary equipment that would be in the ground. And it does not require that the latest technology be deployed. We support technology. We think it's very imperative. We would love to have a dialogue to enhance the bill and to address our concerns. We support streamlining efforts. But at this point, this bill is not ready for prime time, and we believe it needs additional work. Uh, another point is accidents that could happen because if the equipment was to fall on the road and you have multiple carriers on the pole, Who's going to be responsible? How does that get divided up? You've all been in local government. You know who gets hit first. It's the city. And then we have to go back after all the carriers to try to figure out who's responsible for, and apportion out damages and costs. So I think a lot of things still need to be looked at. I applaud the industry for trying to do streamlining. This is not it. This is not ready for prime time. Let us work with you two and them to come up with some better language. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable chair and committee members. Thank you. I'm Crystal Jabara. I'm a council member in the city of San Marcos. I'm also the past president for the San Diego Division of the League of California Cities. Um, both entities have sent letters in opposition to this. Um, I want to thank my local assembly person, Marie Waldron, who's always been a great representative of the people, um, has been in favor of public um, um, local public control. I think a lot of the elected officials have said many of the points that I want to make, but I, I just want to emphasize the fact that this technology is not ready to roll out. This bill is not the right bill. Send it back, put something meaningful together, go ahead and figure out a way to streamline processes, to have fair and reasonable fees charged, to have some public input. If you pass this, all of that is taken away from the local people, the people that we as council members that many of you have to answer to, and they're asking us why they don't have any input anymore. We are, will remove money from our budgets for police and fire. We count on some of that revenue. We provide free Wi-Fi in our parks to our children at our libraries. All of that will be gone. It will be taken out of our hands. We'll have no control over that. So I am respectfully asking you to send this one back, create one that's a little more meaningful for our local communities. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Megan Sally Wells. I'm a council member and former mayor of Culver City. And I've come to speak on behalf of my colleagues on the city council and my community. Uh, SB 649 hands a blank check to the telecommunications corporations and it rips apart community benefits, community interests, and community input. Local governments all across our great state are standing in opposition to this bill. We're on the front lines of our community representation and we're asking, we're here to tell you that SB 649 hurts our constituents who are also your constituents. How many people come to you and ask for less democracy, less representation? The telecommunications industry might be asking you for it, but our communities are decidedly not. The biggest losers in this bill are apartment tenants living in upper story units. They will be the most severely impacted by infrastructure over which they have no voice and no choice. Historically, they're often the least represented in the halls of power. I'm standing up for them, and I'm hoping that you will too. In yesterday's Sacramento Bee, this bill was called the Triple Ripoff. It's in your hands to stop it. There's a difference between streamlining and steamrolling. Please vote no on SB 649. Um, right now, I have one minute and 23 seconds left. 
Um, you can have the whole one minute and we'll give you the 23 seconds and then after that we'll have me choose the fact sure. like to follow so I, I apologize but this is the I understand, uh, Madam Chair Members. Julian Navarro on behalf of the urban counties of California. I just want to mention a couple of points that haven't been raised. The mandatory leasing has been raised, but the fact that the bill also requires uh, if a county or city wants to ever use that street light or pole again, we have to pass a board resolution with substantial findings to even have access to that pole again. We find that unprecedented. Uh, I've represented counties for 12 years. I've worked in here in the building for 20. I have never seen a, a move like this where the state is telling cities and counties, here's our infrastructure and here's the cost. Uh, I also wanted to mention the increased uh, liability for local governments. And I also wanted to mention that local governments, whenever we do a new program or we're given a new duty, we have to report. We have to say this is how we're spending your local public dollars. There's no reporting and no accountability on this bill, and I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Horvath. I'm a city council member in the city of West Hollywood and former mayor and proudly represented by Assembly Member Bloom. I also serve um, on the board of directors for the LA County Division of the League of California Cities as well as on the executive board for California Contract Cities Association. We are all united in our opposition to this bill. Thank you. Great, thank you. I have 10 seconds left for anyone's quick speech, and then we're going to just me too. Thank you. Coalition of Concerned California Cities uh, strongly opposes this bill because it's um, it overrides proven construction safety codes, and, it, and it's an unconstitutional gifting of the people's property to the for-profit wireless industry. We urge your no vote. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could start with the Me Too's, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, Ronnie Berdugo here on behalf of the League of California Cities, 175 cities on the record in opposition. League of California Cities is also opposed. Uh, respectfully ask for your no vote. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Members. Lauren De Valencia representing the American Planning Association here in strong opposition. Thank you. Hi, J.D. Wasilko, San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, and we are opposed to SB 649. Don Gilbert for San Francisco PUC in opposition. Nicolo DeLuca here in opposition on behalf of the following 23 cities and counties, Oakland, San Leandro, Walnut Creek, Palo Alto, Emeryville, Berkeley, San Pablo, Santa Ana, Hayward, Hesperia, Tulare, Buena Park, Laguna Beach, Imperial County, Placentia, Mission Viejo, Stanton, Brea, Fullerton, Huntington Beach, Mariposa County, Mendota, and South San Francisco. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Members. Karen Lang on behalf of the Napa County Board of Supervisors, the City and County of San Francisco, and Mayor Edwin Lee, Kern, San Luis, Stanislaus, Fresno, San Joaquin, and Sonoma, all in adamant opposition to this bill. Thank you. Sylvia Solis, Shaw on behalf of the City of Santa Monica in strong opposition. Thank you. Andrew Antwi on behalf of the City of Beverly Hills in strong opposition. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Kathy Christian on behalf of the County of Marin in strong opposition. Jonathan Clay on behalf of the County of San Diego and the City of Encinitas in opposition. Michael Arnold on behalf of the City of Oxnard in opposition. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Paul Gonzalez with Joey Gonzalez and Son. We represent over 60 cities throughout the state, and in the interest of time, I won't list off those cities, but we are opposed. Jordan Ellison with Ellison Wilson Advocacy on behalf of the cities of uh, Inglewood, La Cunada, Flint Ridge, Santee, and El Centro. Uh, William Now, registered voter. Uh, this bill is portrayed to be uh, the only way to provide wireless technology progress. It's not the only way. And I will Thank you. proceed by handing out the rest of my statement. Thank you. Hi. This is Steve Wallach on behalf of the County uh, Board of Supervisors for San Bernardino County and Ventura County in opposition. And Jamie Miner on behalf of the City of Downey and Town of Apple Valley in opposition. Thanks. <clears throat> Bob Naylor on behalf of Orange County in part for public safety reason in opposition. Antoinette Stein, PhD, on behalf of Environmental Health Trust and the children of the state of California. Please vote no. Cyrus Devers for the Protect Our Local Streets Lobbying Coalition opposed to the bill. Thank you. Laura Parr on behalf of the city of Riverside, Long Beach, and San Carlos in opposition. Michael Murphy with the city of Santa Clarita opposed. Will Murat, uh, City of Vallejo, City Manager's Office, opposed the bill. Audrey Durfer on behalf of the County of Sacramento, the County of San Mateo, and the Association of Environmental Professionals in opposition. 
Madam Chair, David Jones, on behalf of the cities of Glendale, Burbank, uh, the cities of Marin County, uh, Murrieta, Pasadena, San Marcos, and Santa Rosa in opposition. Michael Davitt, President of California Contract City, 74 cities strong, oppose. Marcel Rodardi, Executive Director of California Contract Cities Association, 74 cities, 8 million residents were opposed. Madam Chair and members, Doug Houston representing the California Park and Recreation Society. We are also opposed. Uh, good afternoon, Kyle Jones with Sierra Club California and also on behalf of Environmental Working Group and California League of Conservation Voters opposed. Thank you. Mary Beth Brangan, Ecological Options Network opposed. Thank you. Lori Johnson on behalf of Monterey County Board of Supervisors, the cities of Salinas and Watsonville in opposition. Good afternoon, Tony Rice on behalf of the city of Whittier in opposition. Hello, Jean Hurst here today on behalf of the boards of supervisors of the counties of Los Angeles, Riverside, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz in opposition. Hello, Madam Chair, members. Tom Stallard on behalf of the city of Woodland. Cities are not roadblocks. We don't want to be roadkill either, so we'll oppose this bill. Thank you. Terry Kilgore, Assistant City Manager for City of Vallejo and former Innovation Manager for the City of San Jose who negotiated many of the terms of the deals that were quoted earlier to tell you those are erroneous and we are strongly opposed to this bill. Thank you. Sandy Maurer, Director of the EMF Safety Network, strongly opposed based on the science of wireless harms. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the Utility Reform Network return in opposition to the bill. Are there any others in opposition? Uh, first, I'd just like to thank all of you for doing the timeline. I know it's um, tough to do that, so thank you very much for having the patience today. Um, so we'll go move on to um, questions of the committee. And um, if anybody would like to start or... Okay, we'll go with uh, Assembly Member Waldron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, there's a lot. <laughs> um, so there's quite a few issues that have been brought up um, and a lot of, um, you know, opinions on both sides. So I just wanted to kind of ask a couple of questions about three things that seem to be the gist of a lot of the discussion. Part of it is, number one is the payments. Number two is the streamlining of the process versus local control, which is you know a big part of it. And then the rural versus the big cities. Um, you know, number one, the, the payment part of it. So my questions are, the costs that are in the bill, there's a couple of different costs, and some of them are a little confusing. And I was going to ask if you could delineate those costs and, you know, with the amendments and everything else, exactly what we're talking about. Um, we have the cost for attachments uh, to the, the poll. It's ba based on various factors. There's location, there's investment, there's the depreciation, all of those things um, that have to be looked at, what would be paid towards the, the city or the county. Um, Plus, there's a $250 additional payment on top of that. Um, there's also a permit and the permit process, um, an annual administrative permit that could be mutually agreed and negotiated. Could you expand on that a little bit and, you know, how that lines out? Because I think that's... You know, first of all, we modeled, uh, when we amended the bill, we modeled it after another program uh, created by uh, Buchanan Bill that was passed here by the legislature about three years ago. That, uh, that required uh, utilities to provide their polls to other competitors or other uh, telecommunications companies uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that poll served a uh, uh, mutual, mutually beneficial uh, 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 a benefit to the society as a whole so we don't have monopolies in the state of California. That, that poll, if, if every company had their own poll, we would have, you know, 15 polls in one site. Mm you know, and distributed in every, that would be blighting. That would be, that would look horrific. So we understand that we can't, we don't want that and we can't have that. So it, it better, it would be better to have one poll that's with those utilities, but we also want competition. 
and we want all the, the, the companies to have, have equal access to that, that so that they could provide um, the service to, the, to their customers. And we understand in California that as long as you have competition, there's a downward trend in, in, in the cost of, of services provided to, to customers. So, uh, and we've had that in California. Cost of, of cell phone use has gone down, cost of internet has gone down, as long as we've had competition. So, uh, so the Buchanan Bill basically said uh, you, you, you have access to the poll, but you have to pay the owner of the poll the full cost of accessing that poll. Whatever it costs them to erect the poll, maintain the poll, and any opportunity uh, loss, uh, uh, any lost opportunity to uh, gain revenue from the poll, you have to make them whole on that. So when, when the cities came here and said that this is a taking, that we're forcing them to, to use this for at no cost, that is absolutely untrue. They will be compensated 100%, 100% of the cost that, uh, of, of using that resource. If it's a pole, if it's a lamp post, if it's a light post, uh, whatever the vertical infrastructures that exist that's, uh, and are owned by the city, whatever it costs them to put that, it can be $1,000. It can be 1000 it can be 2000 It can Again, it's, it's a formula that's put in according to what the cost of that uh, resource costs the cities. Um, so they will be made completely whole by the placement of that technology on that resource. In addition to that, they get an additional $250 uh, per attachment site, which is you know, uh, something that we compromised in the Senate, but it, uh, when you look at the amount of sites, this is gonna be an enormous amount of money for the cities, make no mistake. They will make, not only will they be made whole for the use of, of their poll, but in addition to that, $250 for every single cell tower in one block, it's possible you might have eight. And if you start to do the math statewide, this is a lot of money that's gonna go into the, to, to the budgets of cities, money that currently today they are not collecting. Not one of those cities is getting compensating for, for that under this bill. This would make a lot of money available to the cities. In addition to that, it would uh, allow the city to uh, charge uh, fees, uh, the permit fees. It would uh, uh, allow the city uh, to charge for uh, uh, other fees such as encroachment of building permits. Frankly, I mean, there, there is so much uh, cities can do to help with this and, and to be part of the solution. And, and, and for them to say that, uh, that this that strips away all their authority is completely false. They are trying to mislead this committee today in, in opposing this bill. Did I leave out any, any other fees? That uh, the, the observation that I would make is maybe a historical one, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, the FCC and the Public Utilities Commission of California decades ago established rules for attaching to telephone poles and energy infrastructure throughout the state. They adopted formulas and it was cost based. So a competitive carrier like AT&T that owns 300,000 poles in the state, we are required under your government regulations to make our poles available to our competitors at cost per year. That is how this whole issue of accessing infrastructure has started. In 2011, Assemblywoman Joan Buchanan, as you just heard, uh, passed legislation that extended the same model to municipal-owned poles so that everyone could attach to municipal-owned poles. So in this bill, SB 649, it simply extends the model that you have already adopted previously to city-owned vertical infrastructure, access at cost to cover the entire cost of whatever it costs the city to erect the infrastructure, maintain the infrastructure, whatever the building permit and administrative cost might be, plus $250 per attachment per year. So historically, this is not new. We have been doing this for decades. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so that's the cost part of it. So there is full cost recovery. Full cost recovery which, plus. Two hundred fifty dollars plus per the two hundred fifty and the permitting and the yes. negotiated mutually fees. Those things could, as you said, go up into a thousand or more dollars plus the two fifty, plus the permit. Yes. Okay. Um, so then the second thing is the streamlining of the process, which everyone likes streamlining, versus local control, which is a very critical and important issue. And as someone who worked or served in uh, local government. 
also worked as a staffer in local government, is, is very important. Um, so, okay, so right now a single cell siting, uh, according to my analysis, could take two years or more to site because we don't really have a process in place for the new technology. Um, you're saying in so many words, you want to make this more how it's currently being done uh, with technology, not quite as new, but the way it's been done for years. We're not really recreating the wheel as far as a process. It's more incorporating these um, single cell or small cells now into this other type of process. Um, so streamlining is important, but so the questions I have is, what protections are in the bill now for cities regarding local control and aesthetics? And that was one of the things that was really important to me. You know, what does it look like aesthetically? What protections, what discretion is there for cities in this bill uh, that they feel like they have control? Well, the bill allows cities to create uh, uh, design guidelines around the implementation. So they can they can create their their re requirements in terms of how uh, this uh, technology is put on the pole, what it looks like, mm -hmm. uh, how much space it takes. All those things can uh, they can develop a policy around that. But the important thing about them doing that is that it establishes a policy that everybody must follow. It doesn't. It doesn't do it just for one one company or another. Everyone has to follow the same rules and and conform to the same design guidelines. So the cities have the power to protect the aesthetics of of these facilities in their communities. Okay, so they can develop design guidelines. Um, also, as far as citing them, location. Uh, <coughs> What? And they can also work with uh, the industry to, to work on a, on a site and a location plan. Mm -hmm. Vertical infrastructure will not be uh, uh, the only place that they're going to be uh, uh, allowed. And this bill doesn't cover anything else. So that, that will give the cities room to negotiate with the telecommunications as to where they want to place their facilities and how. Mm -hmm. And, they, and they, ha they maintain full discretion as to how to do that under a, a, a plan. Again, the plan has to be made available to everybody equally. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, uh, in everything that I did, I ensured that these uh, uh, opportunities were allowed to all the providers to make sure that you don't have anyone get, uh, receiving any kind of, uh, you know, special benefit over their competitors. We want everybody to have an equal uh, opportunity to cite these antennas with following the same design guidelines and fa failing, following the same opportunities to negotiate the placement of the antennas. Okay. Um, okay. So, citing. We're, we're talking about the the bill really covers citing small assembly cells, member. Cells if I could just add on, I'm sorry to interrupt okay. you, but it it, it also uh, gives them the ability to come up with a rule on co-location of of facilities. There might there might be a way to co-locate. There might not be, depending on the resource, and and they will decide that based on the resources that are, are available to them. Okay. Um, so the process for small cells we're talking about is in the public right of way. Yes. And right away, in addition to in commercial zone areas. Yes, um, right away. So for an area that is not in the right of way, say a park, what would the process be? Is it still as it is with cities they can actually? They would, they would negotiate that with the cities on a case by case. Yes. May I add to that, yeah. Mr. Chairman? Um, uh, for facilities out, that are owned by the city that are outside the public right of way, uh, the bill requires that it be a non-discriminatory opportunity to, to build the infrastructure, and the cities are able to charge commercial rent when you're outside the right of way. So whether you're attaching to a city parking lot, you have to get permission, you have to pay the fees and permits, but they're able to, com uh, to negotiate commercial rent, whether it's a park, et cetera. So outside the right of way, pay commercial rent. Inside the right of way, this bill has the fixed formula, much like we do on all the other infrastructure we build today. Mm -hmm. And with regard to the permitting process, if I may just elaborate one more time, we have been building infrastructure in the state of California and across the United States for 100 years. We always knock on City Hall's door 
first. We always go through whatever requirements and permitting processes are in place. We are never able to build without full permits and to reimburse localities for all of their expenses. So this bill simply suggests that we take small cells and put them into that type of permitting process that it's well understood, well established, and we will always in the future have to knock on city hall, city hall door first mm -hmm. to get those permits. Thank you very much. Okay, um, and then the, the last part of the streamlining versus local control, the, one of my cities has a historic downtown that has been in existence prior to its incorporation in 1888, it goes way back. Um, so it has special aesthetics, special needs, and I know that mm -hmm. you know, our community would not want to have a cell tower or it's even a small cell in there because of all the efforts and infrastructure that went in to maintain the historic character of that district. So this bill exempts historic districts. Yes, uh, it exempts historic districts so they're not made subject to uh, what what the historic uh, the historic districts not made subject to that. We, we, we thought that'd be fair. But if the city wants to negotiate, like the design guidelines could have covered adding small cells to historic districts. They could have had a, 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 a design guidelines for, for historic districts particularly. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and if they want to, uh, you know, continue to cite cells, sites at historic districts, you know, they, they, they can still negotiate that. But uh, we just thought it'd be easier for cities to deal with that and we exempted historic districts at their request yet they're still opposing but we've been very responsive mm -hmm. to what the cities have said and largely a lot of their comments that they made here are untrue because we have an amendment that's covered those arguments one way or another okay um madam chair i do have one more opposition. point but I, I think the opposition wanted to say something also no. I don't know. Uh, you're, you're okay okay um so the last thing is the rural versus big cities my district um has wonderful cities but they're not you know million person cities they're smaller cities um and the vast majority of the land mass of my district is rural and agricultural so i believe the capital budget we were talking about a capital budget upwards of two and a half billion dollars to try to get small cells incorporated throughout the state is uh, that's sort of what we're looking at um so if large cities like currently, I mean, I don't want to name the cities, but if they were, you know, working on maybe 11,000 a poll, 15,000 a poll, that, and, and the fact that they would get more bang for the buck citing in the larger city if you're going to pay that much, you know, the service would go to the larger cities, leaving out the smaller and rural areas. Is that true? Because there's only so much money in the pot. Can you... And, and let me try to uh, uh, understand your question by making a comment on my, my side because, again, the cities are, are, are very upset about the pricing. Even if we make them whole, they want more money, and that's going to add to the cost of this unrolling out this program. And it's going to make it much more difficult to go to under, underserved areas and make this investment because uh, where you have a, a smaller customer base, paying those kind of, 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 of dollars is going to make it uh, much more difficult to cite these antennas where you have a smaller base of customers. They're going to be required to pay. Imagine if the f if the costs were ten thousand uh, dollars. Let's say it, it's a thousand or two thousand per poll, and and twenty poles are, are 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 required to be put in an area, and that makes that that cost about twenty thousand per year just in rent. Forget about service, forget about the equipment. Just in rent, every year they're going to be paying about $20,000 for a small service area. If you had 20 customers in that area, mm -hmm. they would be required just in, to pay just in rent, each one $1,000 added to their phone bill. And that's a fact. And that's, that's where we need the help of the cities. If they could get off of this issue of, of, the, of the cost uh, of the poll, they could actually be helping us to bring this service to the most underserved areas in the state, reducing that cost. Why should if and if and if there is a government of a city in your district that says, you know what, we understand that we don't have, you know, we want to bring this technology here, uh, and we want to we want to charge a very low rent. Why is it fair for your customers to pay, pay into a system-wide uh, 
program where, where some areas are charging two or three or four thousand dollars. Basically, your your uh, customers, uh, in, in the customers in your district are going to be paying through their phone bill to subsidize municipal services in some other part of the state that they may never visit. Mm -hmm. That's why we really need a bill that's balanced and fair for everyone across the state. I've been working very hard to reduce the cost of adding to the poll, and and you know. We can't, we can't take the poll from the cities. It belongs to them locally. They have made the investment. That it's still a resource for them. I believe in compensating them fully. That's why we have. We, we added into the bill uh, a formula that compensates them 100% for the cost of that poll. They have to show that there's a co cost of, of, of putting that resource in their community, and that will be used in, to be plugged into the formula. And then on top of that, we're still giving $250, and, and they're, still, they're still not happy. But we need the cities to be part of this, of this process and this solution. And, and they control the permitting process. We're still giving them that, although we're, we're allowing for, for a, some reasonable processes to, to happen that still protects public safety, that still conforms to building code standards, that still uh, uh, meets uh, the, the, the needs of them to look out for the public safety of, of their communities. All that is in there in the bill. They still retain that. But I think I, I, I believe that the, the, the true nature of their opposition comes from the part where we're only providing them to a full, full cost recovery plus a 250 for attachment. I think that's the area. But this is where we need more of their cooperation to help make this more affordable and easier to bring to underserved areas of the state. Okay. Um, thank you. And, you know, this bill is double referred to communications and conveyance. So, you know, I spent a lot of time working through this bill and the amendments, hearing and listening, and, uh, you know, I, it's an important <coughs> discussion. So, I mean, both sides are making key points. But I think it's a discussion that needs to continue because these issues are important to our residents. They need to have quality wireless service. Uh, you know, my area, there's places where kids can't download their homework because we have such a rural backcountry. We just don't have service. So, um, you know, I hope that this discussion can be resolved and, and move, move so that we can continue to work on it. Thank you. member. Gonzalez Fletcher. I'm going to be quick. Um, I, I'm going to support this bill today and um, hope to see it eventually in appropriations. I just want to um, to note my desire to have more than hopes and dreams that we have um, access not only in rural areas but in poor uh, communities like ours that um, maybe the center city has really good access. Um, there are parts of our of our community that both the senator and I represent that don't have that same access and I know he also represents some of the rural parts that don't as well. So I know he's committed to that. I, I know the um, companies have heard from me on this and I just hope that we can maybe have some equity language in there that maybe gives us a little little bit more assurances that this is, um, you know, the reduced cost that we're providing uh, for the companies results in actual uh, disbursement of this technology to the communities that need it so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Assemblymember Caballero. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me just say that I really appreciate the, um, the discussion. Uh, everybody's still here. Um, this is not an easy bill. Uh, and you've spent a lot of time working on it. And let me just say that I've, I um, thank you for, for all of the information. I still have a bunch of questions. Um, I've read it carefully, and, um, and there are some issues that, that concern me because I think I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a soft spot here, um, and I'm, I'm struggling because I want to see us get there. Uh, but I don't think it's there yet. And I, the, the, one of the areas I'm concerned about is the discussion about small cells. So I wrote down one of the testimonies, statements, was that small cells uh, are going to blend into the polls. But I look at the definition of a small cell, and it's, it's a wireless telecommunications facility, um, such as towers, utility poles, transmitters, base stations, and emergency power systems. And then... Um, and then there's, there are definition that talks about equipment. And, you know, maybe I'm just not reading it well, but, but the, the pictures that I saw when we were talking about this um, look very innocuous. It's just almost like an extension on the pole. 
And uh, if we had the technology and you said, here's what it looks like, I would feel much more comfortable uh, about it, kind of notwithstanding all the local, local control issues. I'm, I, I spent 15 years in local government, so local control is pretty important to me. And I don't know how many times I came here and I testified against this, <laughs> the, the legislature taking that away. Uh, but it's easier if it's a smaller device. And yet then it, it starts getting into 35 cubic feet and um, 9, 21, and then 35. And that's big. And, um, and, and in, in my community, just, just kind of as a foundational statement which, about why it's so important to me is that, is that the electric boxes on the sidewalks have started to get painted in my community. It's artwork because they look so ugly. And they're in the public right away, number one. And number two is um, in our cities, we've, we've, there are county and incorporated areas that, ha that have all the old poles in them. And we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars undergrounding those because they, they look so bad and they're in the poorest parts of our community. And so I'm concerned about the aesthetics. Sometimes that gets poo-pooed because um, it, 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 it's seen as frivolous. But in some of our communities, the aesthetics are pretty important because of all the other stuff that's there. And some of it's pretty old. So, so that's why you know the, the, the sizes are important. I was trying to imagine uh, what the sizes could be. Um, and so that's one, that's, that's one of the issues. Um, so maybe you can. Yeah, and absolutely. Okay. Again, uh, uh, there, there are design guidelines that the states, uh, the cities could, could implement that get to uh, some of the uh, aesthetics issues. That's, that's one test. The other test is, of course, you cannot put something that's so big on a pole that it, that it, it defies the, 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 specific, the engineering specifications of that utility. So you can't really put more weight on, on, a, on a pole or a light fixture, whatever, uh, that, uh, that, um, uh, that does, that's not consistent for what that pole was designed to do. There, it has a, a purpose that it was designed for, and if, if tenants can't be placed there, the cities can absolutely not allow that to happen, especially if, if you're going to be putting a lot of weight on, an, on, a, on a structure or if it's going to uh, hamper its ability to, to uh, do its job uh, safely and in the best public interest. Um, again, um, design guidelines are very important in this, in this uh, discussion because every, every community is different. Some communities don't have vertical structures. Others, others have gone uh, underground. There'll be areas that don't have vertical structures, and there'll be uh, the, the cities. Uh, real, I mean, you can't really, uh, you know, require somebody to use something that doesn't exist. So there'll definitely be uh, a process of working with the cities to uh, decide, you know, what's the best approach to to bring this technology into those areas. Because I mean, it, this technology will not work if it's if it's not equally spaced. And and in its within the the proximity of the users of this technology. I guess that's the second question that I have is I, I didn't see anywhere that gave the cities the ability to do the design guidelines. Yes. yes. So that, so may I sure. May I absolutely. Uh, if you will look at uh, six lines twenty to 20. page six lines twenty, lines, uh, 20 through twenty two is the first spot where if you access vertical infrastructure in a uh, uh, in, in the public right of way. Um, it's subject to, among other things, reasonable fees, terms, and conditions, which may include feasible design and co location standards. So it's page six, lines 20 through 22. Um, also on page, um, uh, page five, um, lines 33 through 35, sorry, I, I made you go backwards. Um, it talks about the various conditions that can be imposed um, as a condition of a permit, um, whether right. inside or outside the right of way. And on lines 33 to 35, it again says condition to comply with feasible design and co location standards. Um, so, so my, my concern there is this, this was, and I guess this was, this is what gets to the design standards or the feasible design is that. Is that this is anticipated to be a ministerial act, mm -hmm. so where you're you're not having hearings, you're not in you know inviting any testimony, and um, and so I mean theoretically the cities could say it's got to be you know an inch in width and it's not feasible, and it it and and meanwhile you say 
that's not fair. That's we can't make it that small. You know, I, I'm 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 just trying to be practical here, and I. Like I said, I think there's a sweet spot here, but but I didn't read that as giving the cities the authority to to set unreasonable uh, design standards in in a in a ministerial permit only process, and and so I'm struggling with how you, as a city, how you would actually design, a, um, set set up some design con, con, um, uh, uh, criteria there that actually makes sense. From from your set standpoint, that that doesn't look like it's a ruse. And, and there's nothing holding the cities back from having public hearings to design those standards and including the community in that process to design those standards. They're going to come up with a document that I believe will require community participation to make sure that people in the community have the input in terms of what kind of standards they want their local cities to have. So there's nothing stopping them from doing that in that process. But if you have the sizes in the bill then they can't do any design standards that don't meet the sizes <laughs> that are in the bill. I don't, under, I don't understand what In you other mean. words, if you... It, it, so that, that's why I was getting to the... I don't, I don't see how you can set des designs if, in fact, it says that um, the definitions tell you that the equipment can't be more than six cubic feet in volume and that the... The individual piece of assorted equipment on pole structures can't exceed nine cubic feet. Mm -hmm. And that, that's an attempt to pretty much def create a, at least a definition, something that would would serve as a as a guide. But uh, we, I mean, to be honest with you, I'll, I'll ask the industry because they know they have a better idea of what this is going to look like if it's if it's really already in in uh, design specs and if they have the volume already. Through the chair, uh, Assemblywoman. So those two requirements. First, uh, the small cell has to be consistent with the definition and the volumetric requirements. Uh, so that's their independent requirements. So that's requirement one, number one. Number two, uh, you have to understand those volumetric limitations are cumulative inside. So it's not like you put a 21 cubic feet um, thing on, t on a telephone pole, the individual components of the small cell are broken up on the pole. So that's where you see in the language that no individual component of that cumulative volumetric limit may be larger than nine cubic feet. That was a, an amendment that the author and sponsors took to, um, to address these concerns about, uh, about the size limitations. Uh, and then the other uh, point about feasible design and co-location standards, that is a separate requirement in addition to the volumetric requirements. So there are two ways, that gives two ways that local governments can address the aesthetics of small cells. Okay. So I, I guess I get back to my point, which is that, um, that if we set what the, what the total amount can be, Yes, that that it becomes difficult for, for cities to say, look, we've decided we're gonna go with less. Um, and if you're telling me that you can do it, great. Then, then I, I mean, I'm not. It's not great, but, uh, but the, but the, but the bottom line is the way that that, if we are prescriptive about, about these numbers, then they've got to meet the numbers, mm -hmm. and you can sue them, if they're doing anything in their process, that doesn't comply with these numbers. And 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 what you can say is you're not doing this in good faith, and so so my cons that's why I said you know if if I knew what the what the technology looked like I'd feel a lot more comfortable with the process that says look one of the reasons we're streamlining this is because we can get the 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 assurance that was mentioned by uh, Assemblymember Gonzalez Fletcher, which is that we're really going to provide access to all communities because I think that's one of the issues I'm very concerned about. But, but because we don't know what they look like, um, and, and, and we say, okay, you have the flexibility, but, but I'm concerned that it really isn't here because there are some, the definitions that just don't, don't meet the pictures that you showed me, and I'm concerned about that. Matt, uh, may, may I uh, offer a couple of thoughts? Uh, first off, uh, the, the language we're referring to is on page 9 of the bill, uh, line 3 through 16. And in each of the uh, identification uh, descriptions of the various equipment, these are does not exceed. 
-hmm. does not exceed. During this debate uh, in the state Senate, there was a great deal of concern about the size of the equipment. And many, many senators wanted, and some of the opposition, maybe all the opposition, wanted smaller, not larger. And so we identified different pieces of the equipment so that they cannot exceed these sizes. They must be at or smaller. Uh, and that fits what is being manufactured. And it addressed the concerns in the Senate. And I might add, there are FCC standards for the deployment of small cell technology. And these numbers are smaller than what is, uh, what is uh, recommended by the FCC. Thank you very much. In addition to that, I just want to uh, mention that the that the uh, the revenue formula uh, gets uh, it, it's they'll pay less money in rent when the when the actual uh, unit or the te uh, equipment is smaller. When it takes up less uh, space on the pole, there's actually uh, less money that they'll pay f to cite it there. So there is a financial incentive for the industry to actually make this equipment as small as possible. Okay, I appreciate that. And then we had a conversation, I've, I've got a, a couple of, of, of issues, but I, I, we had a conversation about um, the, um, uh, for lack of a better word, communities being able to opt out if they don't want the 5G technology period. And I, I just wanted to, to ask you about that because um, <clears throat> it, it, what, what we talked about is that it's, there, it's it's a it's a unified system, but it's permissive. You can opt out. So. Yeah, and I was I was wrong in saying there was okay. an opt out permission. That's why I sent you the information okay. that shows that okay, cities, I didn't it. yeah, cities could uh, to could decline. Uh, they have the power not to accept the permit uh, uh, based on uh, the the, the uh, providers not complying with, with either design guidelines or the the requirements of the you know the public safety requirements of the program. But uh, yeah, you're right. There is no okay. opt out. Yeah, so it's not an that opt out. And I, that you can and I sent deny that the message permit. to okay, clarify okay. that earlier. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just yeah. wasn't sure that I was reading that. Okay. Assemblymember Bloom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate all the comments uh, uh, from the proponents. We've heard a, a, a good deal of them. Um, I have a couple of questions for, I think, the person uh, who's probably best situated um, as the representative from the League of Cities, if, if that's possible, sure. through the chair. Thank you. So um, the, um, uh, the bill as it's currently uh, uh, written requires um, up to, I guess it's a, is it a fixed $250 um, uh, amount plus the costs that would be payable to cities for each installation, as I understand it? Is, is that essentially correct? It is up to, but it is also possible, as it was discussed by the opposition earlier, that deals like uh, a city can negotiate with a carrier and charge less and get other benefits. And so my question, thank you for, uh, for the clarification. My uh, question um, is uh, for the cities that you represent, um, what is your response to that and what, uh, why are there remaining concerns? Yeah, thank you, Assembly Member. Thank you, Chair, for letting me respond. Um, on behalf of the League of California Cities, um, if I can um, just protect, uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't also protecting the integrity of our public officials that came from all over the state to testify today. Um, there was a comment made about them providing misleading testimony. Just wanted to clarify that nothing was misleading about their testimony. Um, in, in response to your question, Assemblymember Bloom, and I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to do so. Um, unfortunately, because the League of California Cities did, did not assist in drafting the fee language for this particular provision as it applies to permits and what they call attachment rates. Um, we actually see that the $200 uh, cap um, applies to what has currently drafted in the language, uh, an administrative permit fee um, and the attachment rate, which would be the lease, which would be the lease for the small cell equipment. And that is, that is our interpretation. Um, thank you for responding. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting me respond to that. Thank you. Um, have you been part of the uh, discussions and negotiations over the bill? 
or has the, I should say, should the league, not you personally necessarily? The League of California Cities um, has met with the author's office. We have met with the industry. Unfortunately, what's happened throughout this process, um, as the League of Cities would raise concerns about a particular provision in the bill, um, instead of collaborating um, uh, as, a, as a true stakeholder would, um, the industry would, um, would write an amendment to address um, kind of a general concern. And unfortunately, because of that, uh, we ended up with more problems with the way that the language was drafted um, had we actually collaborated on um, giving them some, some, some technical language and some cleanup. Um, I, I've um, been shown, and I think there was testimony about uh, uh, reimbursement for the current technology being as high as $14,000 uh, um, in at least uh, uh, one city. Can you discuss what the reasons uh, might be for variation in uh, payments under the current circumstance? Uh, yeah, so there are some jurisdictions that don't differentiate between small, small cells, uh, antennas, and macro towers. Um, that may describe some of the, the, what some may consider a high lease rate for uh, wireless facility um, leasing of public property. Um, but the range, to be quite frank uh, with the committee, um, ranges anywhere from free, which, um, as you saw, the city of Sacramento was able to negotiate a deal with Verizon uh, where they actually uh, provided 101 sites for free in exchange for a host of public benefits. Unfortunately, those types of in-kind uh, contributions would be precluded by this bill. Um, and then there are other cities uh, that um, have negotiated leases, uh, $3,000 and upwards, um, for the lease of public property. And to be clear, um, the state has never uh, required local governments to lease their public pro property, and the legislature has never uh, required that local government cities and counties cap how much they can lease uh, that property out for. This would be unprecedented territory for, for local government. So I'd like to ask this question of both uh, uh, proponents and opponents. Yeah. Uh, what is the, uh, from, from my perspective, the, the $250 cap seems relatively arbitrary, but if, if I'm wrong, if there's an economic analysis or some basis um, for that number, I'd like to know. Um, so some cities, uh, it, it's an op it's a, these are market rate leases and these are open negotiations between the wireless industry um, and local governments. Um, some cities have um, figured out what the market rate is specifically uh, for specific corridors within their jurisdiction um, and will charge a rate that is reflective of that. Um, some cities have offered rates lower than that in exchange for other benefits like uh, deployment to underserved or unserved parts of their jurisdiction. Um, and so those are, again, those are open negotiations, um, have never been subject to any kind of, um, of, of a cap on a lease um, for that property. Um, proponents, please. Now again, let me just, uh, I find myself at a disadvantage having to uh, debate somebody that's providing completely misinformation about the bill. And I'm, I, I feel a little dis disappointed by that because the bill is in writing. And it, it's all there for you to interpret. There's nothing that is, uh, you know, there, there, is n no, there is no cap. You cannot put a cap on, on a resource because that would be considered a taking. If, it if it's going to cost, if the cost of putting a resource there uh, translates to putting the equipment there, uh, a cost that's going to be $1,000, that's what the bill requires the cities to get. Well, my, but in addition Senator, my, to that, my, my question only relates to the two hundred and fifty dollar uh, additional fee. I that's an addition too. So if it costs a thousand, they're going to be paying a thousand two hundred and fifty for that pole. And right. again, cost, you, it you, costs plus two fifty. Exactly. Right. So that's full my cost my recovery, full cost recovery plus two hundred fifty dollars. And what I'm asking about is that two hundred and fifty dollar additional amount. Um, has, it relates back to the current uh, uh, system where there's a, apparently in every city a negotiation over what the rates will be and that has resulted in different, uh, different rates in different places and that's being replaced in this bill by a $250 cap and my question uh, has to do with 
what the economic basis for that is. Now, again, the economic basis being that we, we, our, it is our position that the, these resources are in the public domain and they belong to the people of those communities. And they are going to derive a benefit from, that, from them. When you, when you put this technology there, that, that will be a benefit for them to bring this technology. Now, the cities, it was wrongly stated that cities cannot no longer negotiate. That's wrong. Because the cities can, this is a, a guiding policy. If cities want to approach the industry and say, we have a better plan, and we have one that, you know, but, but our plan is going to be made available to all the telecommunication providers, but it will include providing to underserved areas. There's nothing that prevents the cities and the telecommunication providers from, from, uh, from doing that. But this, we feel this bill is required because we also want to keep the costs low. On the one hand, cities are driving up the costs that are making it harder to bring this utility to underserved areas. So we're, it's very important for us to keep the costs low. And they can, they can reduce the costs if they want it to, to make it easier to put into underserved areas. So that's the general principle that we're working on with the crafting of this bill. Um, Senator, underlying, uh, well, there have been a number of questions uh, um, and comments regarding underserved communities. And it, it appears to me that the bill is leaving that up to future negotiation or the um, market somehow um, uh, allowing for that. In my experience, we haven't seen, even in a relatively uh, uh, wealthy community, well-off community like uh, many of my communities, we have not seen the industry implement in certain areas of uh, of district versus others. And just correct me if I'm wrong. There's nothing in this bill that that um, requires a rollout in uh, 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 disadvantaged communities. I think what I'm hearing is that um, if uh, uh, if if we're able to charge less, we will. It'll be easier for the telecommunications companies to do that, but there's no requirement. Is that correct? Well, telecommunications companies want customers. And so I don't think they're necessarily in the business of discriminating against customers, because in the end, uh, they, they spend a lot of money on marketing to, to get customers to subscribe. So wherever customers wanna, want to uh, subscribe, they're, they're going to go to those areas and locate the antennas. But, ha but when you have uh, certain customers that are precluded from using because the costs are so high uh, of unrolling this technology to those, they're not going to go to those areas. And I don't think there's anything that we can do to compel them to do that if it's going to cause them to go out of business. So my, my, my general theory here is, is I'm using the history, history as a, as a guide, history as, as the best teacher, to say what has happened in California. How, how has it been easier to get technology in the hands of people, making it cheaper? And there has been a downward trend in, in the cost of, of cell phone service over the years because cell phone companies com uh, compete with each other. What, what cities are doing is they're increasing the, the bottom the bottom in terms of how low they can go in cost cities by adding costs to this program they're increasing how low they can go in fees that is going to uh, exclude a, a, a whole host of people from the community from participating if we're paying the city's money for municipal services if their concern was really about access that money they could collect they collect from fees which would be for some cities in the millions of dollars could be used to provide better access to cell phone service. But no, they're not going to do that. They're going to use that money for municipal services as they testified here today. That's why it's so important to have the inclusion of cities in this process. We would like for them to either you know, help us keep the, the rates low or, or make a commitment that whatever they collect is going to uh, go toward uh, increased connectivity as, in our communities. You know, as, a, as a former mayor and, and, and council member, I would just respond to that by saying that when um, an elected leader comes up and says, uh, we're going to be using 
these funds for municipal services, I would not presume that they're somehow going to be used for some nefarious purpose. No. So that you as your uh, no, no. our former I local government that. official, well, you didn't say that, but you do imply that they're not going to use them for the benefit of the public through um, at least rollout of telecommunications. They said police and fire. Specifically, which are community priorities, but I, I don't think you know every community is going to use it in those places. But these are all you know local government folks have to prioritize what they use funds for. And as you know, as a former uh, local elected, they are frequently harder and harder to come by, and and things are only getting more and more expensive. So um, you know we have to allow some leeway to local governments to decide how to best allocate funds on behalf of their local residents. And in, 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 in this case, and I'll just uh, uh, conclude my comments here, um, I, I, I just continue to have concerns that the, the formulas that are being utilized here um, are, are, um, need to be improved. And um, I wish there was more time to do that. I think it would be better if this uh, were on a two-year pathway. Um, I'm going to lay off on the bill today, but I, I, I just think there are some remaining issues here. And as uh, others have observed, um, I think that piece around dis uh, disadvantaged communities is one that's extremely important for us to address in a way that assures that the rollout of future technologies is going to benefit all Californians. And I don't see in that, that in the bill right now. Thank you. Mr. Grayson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just to clarify one more time as we move forward in just a, a quick series of questions, mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify one more time, uh, under this bill, is the city prohibited from, nego uh, from, neg from negotiations? No. No. Okay. If, uh, if that's the case, then we go to uh, some discussion that was already that has already taken place concerning language, quote unquote, feasible design and co-location, which can be a bit ambiguous. So actually, who is the one that decides what's feasible and uh, as far as uh, design-wise and co-location? There, there's going to be a public process to decide that as the cities come up with their design guidelines. I'm sure the telecommunication industry will be at the table to, to weigh in in terms of what that is. So are you, are you suggesting then that it's incumbent upon the local agencies to, prior to any application that would come in, to hold public uh, meetings that would decide what are acceptable designs uh, and what feasible would mean for that local agency? I think that's the, the best process to determine that, especially okay. when there is an application and you do have uh, the actual uh, equipment showcased in front of you saying this is what we're going to install and they have an opportunity to see that and to look at how uh, what the requirements of installation are going to be what the connection requirements energy requirements and what their poles are like i mean we, we don't know other i mean california is a very diverse state i mean if you go from san francisco right. to solvang to el centro i mean everybody has uh, uh, different uh, design guidelines uh, community plans and public infrastructure. Okay, so it was said from an opponent that uh, the industry would pretty much be able to go into a local municipality and be virtually unregulated, in which a city would not have uh, discretion over where and how. Uh, but you're suggesting, or actually stating under this bill, that a city clearly uh, retains the ability to say no to location it's 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 all in the bill i mean it's it's on the language here i mean there's plenty of information here just some i'm page five line seven okay uh a cedar economy require that a small cell be approved you, pursuant could you locate that in the bill yes page five line item five line item four a city or county may require that the small cell be approved pursuant to a building permit or its functional equivalent equivalent in, connect, in connection with placement outside the public rights of way or an encroachment permit or its functional equivalent use consistent with sections 7901 and 70 and 7901.1 of the P Public Utilities code, code for the placement in public rights of way and any additional ministerial per permits provided that all permits are issued within the time frames required by state and federal law. And then it goes on to, uh, and then it uh, goes on to give kind of a whole page of conditions 
that uh, is is a regulatory framework. It's so not, would a city be able not to, an ab absence of, of rules. So would a city or county or local municipality be able to then enter into, uh, for instance, an MLA, a master license agreement with uh, a telecom yes. company, or if both parties agreed possibly to even veer away from what this bill is calling for and actually enter into their own contractual agreement uh, and negotiate their whole their whole package Precisely. without even working with this bill. Precisely. Uh, so you're saying, if I understand it correctly, that if a, if a local municipality wanted to, they could actually, uh, with, uh, with the wireless company that uh, has come to their city, they could actually enter into an agreement similar to or in like manner that Sacramento did. Yes. And that this bill does not prohibit that. That's right. That's right. Opposition? Um, thank you, Assemblymember Grayson, for allowing me to respond. Um, unfortunately, um, under on page 5, line 38, um, there's an explicit prohibition on in-kind contributions um, for small cell wireless permitting. Um, and so the deal, in theory, I guess the wireless industry could potentially volunteer such in-kind contributions. Uh, unfortunately, a city would not be able to require, as part of their negotiations, such in-kind contributions for data backhaul, um, um, data access for their um, local police and fire libraries that some cities have provided, or their public parks, um, as you may have seen, uh, that the city of Sacramento was able to negotiate. Okay. And if Senator. I could just point you to uh, page 8, uh, line item 13, and, and uh, this gives the cities the right. This subdivision does not prohibit a wireless service provider and a, a city or county from mutually agreeing to an uh, administrative permit fee or attachment rate that is less different. than the fees or, or different than Which was the, amendment you touched. The, the attachment rate that is uh, established above. I mean, wait a minute. To an annual, uh, wait a minute, from mutually, since it's all... Yeah. Scribbled in. I can't okay. read your writing. Is different than okay, the this is better. It's true. Let me read this. Reread this. I'm sorry about that. This subdivision does not prohibit a wireless service provider and a city or county from mutually agreeing to an annual administrative permit fee or attachment rate that is different than the fees or rate rates established above. That was a committee amendment. That was a committee amendment. Okay. So, um, thank you, committee chair. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So um, having seen this, then it would be possible. Uh, is there a need for clarification from opposition? Would there be a need for clarification f to make sure that the two from page 8 to pay page 5, that there's clarity between what can be required, what can't be required, and then for page 8 where what can be entered into and what is prohibited? Is there a need for clarification there? Sure. Um, thank you for, again, the chance to respond. So, I mean, striking out that language from 38 beyond, uh, as it refers to in-kind contributions, would be a start, uh, because that's a, a, that's a direct prohibition on in-kind contributions, unless the wireless company were to mutually agree to something less, um, I mean, they could agree to providing in-kind co contributions um, and, and rates less than the $250 that's spelled out in the bill. Um, but only if they mutually agree to that. So a city can't, again, this would have to be under a mutual agreement. So I'm actually headed somewhere here. Uh, okay. Thank you for your patience, Chair. But I'm, I'm, I'm actually headed somewhere here. So let's go back to the fee, the $250 in addition to the recovery of expenses. Uh, so the city is able to recover expenses, and then they get an additional $250 on top of that. First of all, the $250, are, how many other states have something similar to this bill? Assemblyman uh, Grayson, uh, there have been 11 states that have passed legislation, 10 signed, similar to this. This fee would be fairly significantly more than in any other state, that the cost recovery plus the fee is considerably more than virtually than any other state. So, would it make us the highest? Yes. All right. So, if that was the case, and I would turn back to so glad to have the League of Cities up here. Uh, have you uh, heard? Because I know that there's some cities that have 
let's say, for instance, they're talking about or the proponents are talking about putting uh, these boxes on light standards. There are some cities that have lighting districts that actually assess fees or tax. Uh, and so something that was said in opposition was that uh, the taxpayer will be subsidizing telecom companies for this. But in, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, wait a minute, if they're getting cost recovery, the city's getting cost recovery, and then now they're getting an additional 250 off of something they were getting absolutely nothing for outside of the only source of revenue, which was a fee or a tax on the resident of that particular lighting district. Have you found any indication by any of the local municipalities that they would actually give that tax relief back to the citizen? So that, uh, I mean, if that poll is being now paid for by a private industry uh, and they're now getting more than what the cost of that poll is to maintain annually, uh, has there been any indication that local municipalities would then, uh, before putting that money into the general account, that they would actually return some money back to or give relief back to taxpayers of a special lighting district? Um, sure. Uh, so the lease revenues that cities generate uh, from small cell antennas or leases of other public property are deposited into city and county general funds and they're flexible dollars so they could be used for any essential public service whether it's police, fire, parks, uh, libraries, etc. cetera. Um, and that's, that's the return of the public benefit. Um, it's, you're, you're, you're correct in your, um, in your conclusion that it's not, it's not a true subsidy in, in the sense that um, wire, you know, wireless companies will have essentially reduced cost access to public infrastructure um, that are now currently subject to market rate leases. Um, this would no longer be a market rate lease, so it would be essentially a discount uh, to the wireless companies. Um, and there is no requirement in this bill to return those cost savings to the consumer. So in that sense, uh, you're correct, there is no, um, uh, it's not a true subsidy in terms of that cost savings not being passed on to the uh, subscribers who are uh, receiving a private benefit from um, the wireless company that they subscribe to. Um, and so for, for, um, for local governments, uh, you're also correct. Uh, it's, it's not a subsidy in the sense that we return money uh, as a tax credit to our constituents or our residents, um, but we return that in the form of a public benefit in terms of paying for our services or for our infrastructure. Right. Okay, so if the bill did not exist and we weren't here today, a lot of people would be very happy. Uh, <laughs> but if we weren't sitting in this room at 4.08 p.m. Uh, on this beautiful day outside, uh, and things were as they currently exist, where certain cities are charging or asking for 3,000 market value, a $3,000 fee per poll, or uh, up to upwards to 15,000. So this bill didn't exist, yet that doesn't change the fixed budget of the infrastructure from the telecom companies of two, two billion plus to roll out technology to cover the cities. Who then gets the coverage? If it's going to cost this much in one city, this much in another city, who ends up with the coverage and who ends up with nothing? You know, the, there is a distinction here that they, these are private companies investing their own private dollars and they're taking a risk and none of our uh, government funds are going into this program. Okay. So they will be uh, making their investment based on, on accessing their, their, their clientele wherever they're going to be located. Right. And I, I suspect that's, uh, you know, in, in, in business, you, 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 I used to run a business for 10 years, so I, I can speak to, uh, you know, how, how, how you can do business and stay in business. But so... You know, you you want to you want to turn a profit, right? And you can't you can't expend more money than than the cost of of, of doing business, uh, or else you will basically go out of business. So, you know, they're gonna they're gonna go out there and assess where it's feasible to provide the service and what uh, in terms of what people are willing to pay. Senator, if I may, uh, just real quick, I'm more convinced and persuaded that the telecom companies, as you say, are going to turn to the profitable side, even if it means they have to pay exorbitant fees right. for that city. It, and it's going to be your urban 
uh, or your rule, I'm sorry, your rule right. and your underserved communities that are going to suffer the most. Now I'm going to make a couple comments. I'm going to give it back to the chair. Only if you make it so expensive. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. So here's a couple of comments and then a statement before I give it back to the chair. It's incredibly disingenuous of industry to come out and promote that this is 5G technology when 5G technology is not even going to be available till 2020. Yeah. To tell you the truth, just be truthful, be honest, and be upfront and say, this is 4G, we want to roll it out because this is how we're going to roll it out because we believe that this is how the easiest transition is going to be for 5G when it comes. That would help tremendously. And on the other hand, it would be, um, it would be kind of nice and refreshing if cities would think more holistic about the state that they're in and would actually consider the fact that they're not the only entity in the entire state and that when you begin to charge absolutely exorbitant fees, understand that you're doing it not at the expense of that company because that company is going to pass those fees down to the taxpayer and so, uh, or to the rate payer, I'm sorry. And that rate payer is going to end up absorb absorbing those fees. But the city makes off and they get off. Now, I, I understand the city, in many cases, the cities are still suffering uh, and feeling the, the very sensitive bruises left from the dissolving of redevelopment. So possibly the state needs to own a little bit of where the cities are right now and how they're still feeling and why they're grappling to try to still cover the, the, uh, the general funds that uh, have disappeared at the, state's, uh, at the state's expense. However, for the cities to, um, to go to a place where it's, uh, it's first come, first serve, and grab all I can get and leave others empty-handed is, is not really being good brothers, good sisters as far as cities working together in the state. It's put us in a position where we now have to consider something statewide that should have stayed on a local level. And so with that, um, to, uh, what I would like to see, if this bill was to move forward, what I would like to see is there has to be some assurance on the rollout for equitable access for disadvantaged communities and for rural communities. If there is no equitability in that, then this is, this is simply asking the legislator to step up and, and be a marketer and, a, and, and do your business for you uh, as an industry. There has to be some uh, assur assurance in that area. There must be some language clarification, as we brought out with the League of Cities here, uh, as far as what's feasible in design and co-location. And then the fact of uh, making sure, because there seems to be some question, I go back to my colleague as far as that sweet spot, and there's got to be some type of a spot where we can all land on where cities feel like they still have the leverage to negotiate, but that the industry and what they're looking for really is certainty where the industry can come into the municipality with some sense of certainty because right now the local municipality has all the leverage with the permit and uh, and others sit and I will tell you I know firsthand it takes two years to pull a permit for something of this sort and so having said that I find it interesting that uh, from three cities in my district and I know that I have uh, electeds that came here and by the way I did notice that uh, when it came to the proponents uh, that spoke in behalf I noticed that uh, we had public safety, medical, education, manufacturing. It went from small business to large businesses. It ranged from urban to rural. Uh, and then I also noticed that uh, in the opposition, with a handful, with the exception of a handful of voices, uh, the one thing everyone had in common was they were coming from a governmental agency. I did, I did have something that came from my district office, and that was... Um, from three of the cities in my district, two of them being the two largest cities, uh, we had eight uh, communicate in opposition and we had 805 constituents communicate in support. So I'll leave that out there. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Assembly Member Vopel. Madam Chair, Committee, I'm a uh, child of the 1950s and 1960s, okay? And I remember that televisions were very large, radios were very large because of the vacuum tubes. And the companies in those days would try to shrink the vacuum tubes desperately 
to get these things down where you could get them in your house, etc. And then in 1962, transistors were invented. And the shrinkage was massive. I could hold a transistor radio in the palm of my hand. It was amazing. To me, it was a, a, an absolute miracle. My first cell phone took up one third of the trunk of my car. <laughs> now I hold a cell phone here that's also a wonderful macro computer that brings everything in the world right to the palm of my hand again. This is the second time that I've gone through shrinkage. <laughs> I call it technological shrinkage. I remember cell towers, the height of redwoods, and they've shrank down to Christmas trees now. And what we're seeing before us here is massive shrinkage from 4G to 5G, 6G, 7G, and so on. I'm looking at these devices. We're looking at technology today, but 10 years from now, who knows? We might be able to put them the size of a coffee cup. So I believe, in my heart of hearts, that this technology will give such a benefit to all the cities, counties, all of our jurisdictions. Because as we deploy these devices, there'll be hundreds and probably thousands of these devices at going rate and $250 a device. You can imagine how many can you hear me nows will be out there when this is deployed. Most technology starts in the urban areas and spreads out. It's kind of like an oil slick, okay? <laughs> Truly is. And technology, and, and my, my uh, assembly member Grayson is spot on, we have to make sure the technology spreads out to the urban areas and the underserved and the poor areas as soon as possible. And I believe that will happen naturally. So I'm kind of going on faith on that one. Um, to finish up, this technology will continue to change the world. Five years from now, when we're 5G deployed, we're going to have so many industries and so much wealth generated that we can't even imagine right now, although the millennials are already working on it, okay, that $250 a unit is not going to seem like much money at all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Assembly member Ridley Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, to the okay. proponents, I know that there's a, a great deal of talk that's uh, gone on about the economic uh, development benefit. Uh, might you know um, how many towers you've had cited on a good year uh, and small sales? Just to, because I, I think the number in the analysis is 30 to 50,000. Uh, industry-wide. I don't know if you have a perspective on California. What's a good year in terms of citing either small sales or towers or combined? I'll take that. Uh, with the chair's permission, uh, I, I can't tell you how many cell towers are statewide, but what okay. I can say is that we're going to need um, uh, a lot more small cells because of the spectrum quality. The, they don't, uh, the spectrum does not propagate as far as a cell tower. So a cell tower might give you 5 to 10 miles radius of coverage, oh. but the small cells for 4G LTE densification, which you're right, uh, uh, goes a few blocks. For 5G, the spectrum is going to be millimeter wave spectrum. That, that spectrum goes much uh, shorter distances, maybe 100 feet, and requires a line of sight. 
So as you move, as, as Moore's Law happens, uh, Assembly Member Vopel, um, and you go from uh, the towers to the 4G LTE small cells to the 5G nodes, you're going to see them get smaller in dimension, and you're going to see them get uh, uh, many, many more. We're going to need about five to ten times the number of 5G nodes as we will 4G LTE nodes. So it really is about P times Q, price times quantity. So this cost uh, formula needs to pencil out in order to bring 5G to California. Oh, um, so the um, nodes are uh, substantially smaller. The, the, what size? Because I've seen photos and all that. What, what, what size are they? Do, do we know? Uh, is it a couple of feet? You mean the distance? The nodes. No, when I, I say nodes, I mean for 5G. The the, the the, yeah, with the, the chair's permission. Now, yeah. So the 5G nodes are currently being invented, to uh, okay. Assemblymember Grayson's point. We're in pre-trial commercial testing, and we've announced in 11 cities that we're doing that right now. We'll be doing that in the city of Sacramento in the second half of this year, um, if all goes well. Uh, and then we're in a desperate race to uh, be the first to deploy 5G in our country. Uh, so uh, th those nodes are expected to be uh, significantly smaller in size than the current 4G LTE small cells. Got it. Um, the, 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 the reason I started this question is to get a sense of how much um, uh, installation activity there would be in a normal course versus what would be anticipated for here. And the thirty to 50,000 number over five to seven years is what the analysis suggests. Uh, so we would anticipate probably no more than 10,000 a year small cell installations. Is that kind of what we're thinking about? I, again. This is the... J just for downtown L.A., Assemblymember Ridley Thomas, we're going to, Verizon alone is going to need um, around 200 to 300 small cells just to densify for 4G LTE. Then you have to multiply that by five to ten times for when we get to 5G. Okay. Um, was there was there another response? Okay. Um, uh, a question that may be kind of simple for you all, but with respect to the um, uh, liability associated with uh, potential either health impacts or some other impacts we might safety impacts. Uh, that rests with the company, or does that shift to the city as a result of accepting that, or if we put in this process and making it, I'm not sure of the term, is it a ministerial permit versus a discretionary? Is that basically what we're doing here? That is that what this bill does? I didn't understand the question. So because we're, if this bill is to pass, we would change the process. Does liability rest with the company that installs if there are safety issues? If for some reason, something we don't think of that arises, there, there is or is nothing, that with the company? There is nothing precluding the local uh, municipal agency from uh, from enforcing all building code requirements. Okay. Public safety is extremely important. There are building. Uh, this doesn't exempt them from following or the industry from following the building code requirements. They are still in place. They must be followed. They have to pull the appropriate, if electricity is, provide, is required, they have to pull an electrical permit, construction permit, and they have to conform to the codes that are imposed by the, the, the U.S. standards. The, the, yeah, may yeah, I, I add a, an additional comment? Uh, uh, Mr. Ridley Thomas, on page four, uh, line 38 of the bill, small cells must comply with all applicable federal, state, and local health and safety regulations, including the Federal Americans with Disability Act right. of 1990. So it reinforces that in the bill, and that was an amendment that was added in the Senate. And liability would rest with the tel with telecom the carrier? Yes. Okay. Um, the... Um, uh, there's, uh, and there may have been mention of this already, and the, the author, whom I regard very highly, who is uh, someone who I have Thank uh, supported in all kind of ways because I think he's sharp on many issues. <laughs> um, but the, the issue with community facilities and safety is not, in my opinion, a, a um, one that uh, has received as much attention as I'd like in this bill. 
the I, I had I read the fire piece a couple times and it yeah. said in or in a fire building or on a fire building. Yes. A fire department building. Does that at all extend that concern extend to schools in any sense? Again, schools are not owned by cities normally. They're part of school districts. Right. This, this bill doesn't uh, govern school districts. But land use goes to the local jurisdiction even at schools. Land, land no, use doesn't reside not, with the local they, education. The cities don't own the land. They don't own vertical structures on, on school property. But in the right-of-way, for example, um, even with uh, this small cell, three, is this 300 feet or 200 feet capacity? Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, 200 feet, but in the public right of way. Yeah. And there's nothing stopping this. The If there is a vertical uh, a pole within the public right of way of a fire station, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing that pre preempts that from being cited there. For me, that would be an ongoing concern if this bill moves forward. Mm -hmm. It would be schools and fire facilities. Um, uh, just for the record, Chair, and uh, to the, and, and the maybe center. I can direct the industry to ask if is there a chance that under the provisions of the bill that under what's allowed under the bill that an, an antenna would ever put be put on school property? It'd have to be negotiated with the school district. It'd have to yeah. be dis dis negotiated with school district. Correct, okay. and of course the bill primarily is about accessing public right-of-way and of course schools are not considered public right-of-way okay um, I would add that uh, charter schools are a little different again uh, not public right-of-way okay um, but it's something to think about I mean I've been looking at this for a few days so uh, I don't know that it's I'm, I'm not settled on that yet this is uh, kind of thinking out loud but thank you uh, the um, the local control argument is uh, somewhat persuasive in my mind um, because the jurisdictions that I represent, the county and city of Los Angeles, the cities of Culver City and Inglewood, uh, uniformly oppose this measure. I suspect there are different reasons why, and I think they have varying levels of positive and maybe not so positive relationships with telecom providers. Uh, but I find it curious that there's uniform opposition um, Assembly member, if yes, I could sir. just correct, not the majority of cities in the state don't don't oppose this bill. Okay, N there isn't a majority of the cities. The, not all cities oppose this bill. Not even a majority of the cities. I, I, just some. Uh, I, it's a very high number. Okay. It's like 197, but it's not. I think yeah, there are over 400, 400 cities, over yeah, 400 no, cities. So, um, so it's not a majority of the cities. Understood. All of the cities in the jurisdiction that I represent okay. <laughs> do not uh, support this proposal. 100. percent And the and the county, which is the largest in the state, does yeah. not support this this measure. Um, and it, it it really gives me pause. Uh, I, I I am not as convinced on the immediate economic benefit and how Sacramento is better placed to make decisions for local government. In my mind, the local officials and jurisdictions do a decent job. The city of Culver City, for example, uh, has made a very substantial investment in broadband. Some, some of you may be aware of that. In order to attract uh, Silicon Beach business, uh, to the uh, city of Culver City, and it's been uh, it's been a great public-private partnership, and they've uh, made a substantial plan to get the entire city and broadband. Uh, uh, I guess the term would be wired, um, and they started on one major corridor uh, in the uh, in the eastern portion of the city of Culver City. The uh, county and city of Los Angeles have each made closing the digital divide uh, high priorities and getting access uh, to wireless across those cities by virtue of uh, senior centers and public libraries. Um, the uh, land use process uh, is a part of in the siting of these uh, uh, small cells and regular towers is a part of how they look, in my mind, at 
uh, access to technology and uh, smartphones and smart devices. And I am not uh, yet convinced that this measure is an appropriate step to remove that local control. Now, I, I have a different experience because I represent a couple of small cities and then a couple of very big jurisdictions. And I think they're sophisticated, they know how to negotiate, and they are um, more able to appreciate the local concerns of their residents as well. Because as I recall, now maybe I'm, I could be a bit confused, but as I recall, in some instances there is substantial residential opposition to these um, uh, devices. And the local institutions and elected officials are very sensitive to the hyper-local issues. And it may not mean much to a, uh, from a sacramental perspective, of whether or not it's in a particular public median, but it may be quite substantial for someone who has great pause about a small cell tower. That's why, though I know you've done a lot of work, you told me about the amendments that you took. Uh, individuals were kind enough to show me all of the all of the amendments, and it sounds like you're even comfortable with making sure language is tight should this move forward. Uh, I am yet uh, convinced about the efficacy uh, and uh, economy and wisdom in supporting this measure. So I won't be supporting it today. You may have other insights about um, uh, local control uh, that because you were a city councilman, but if when I talk to the local elected officials and I go to the community groups and my staff do tonight and throughout the week, we have these things called neighborhood councils in LA or community groups or neighborhood associations, it'll be very difficult to defend voting for such a proposal as I believe it is currently constructed and what its impact might be. Can I, can I reply? I would welcome it. Yeah, because I, I want to make it very clear that when it comes to Californians and how they feel about the 75% of Californians say it's very important for wireless companies to upgrade networks. Okay. That's something they want. Uh, to play small cell and 75% want to play sm small cell devices in publicly owned property. 69% support laws that expedite local approval of small cell. 66% mm. believe that small cell devices should be subject to the same uh, should not be subject to the same approval process as traditional large-scale cell towers. Why, uh, again, this bill does not take away uh, uh, local control. That is, uh, that, is, uh, that, is a normal, that is an enormous myth of the opposition of this bill. We have ensured that the locals still ha retain the authority to, to create design guidelines. They run the permit process. They can uh, they could not approve a permit if if it does not conform to their design guidelines. That there is still a very robust. I mean, we went we went line by line in this bill that showed that the the states ret retain the right to to negotiate with these with these. Uh, I mean, the cities can opt to negotiate. Uh, there's, there's ample language in the bill that gives the local municipalities, uh, uh, the, if, if they want something that cater to the community, I'm sure the companies will, will, will come in and provide, and that's allowed for in the bill. What is very important in this bill, and this is why we need this bill statewide, is we got, we've, got, we're, we've gotten to the costs. Hmm. Unrolling out this program is going to be very expensive, and the truth is these companies are going to recover their costs where they can, where they can. That may be ex certain exclusive areas. If you're going to be paying 2,000 per antenna, and there are going to be, uh, you, you ask the right questions in terms of how many antennas, but do the math in terms of thousands of antennas, right. and there are only a certain amount of customers in a certain area, the companies are not going to go there to charge uh, what could be uh, an additional $1,000 a year to your cell phone bill. Some people may be able to pay that to, to benefit this program, but there will be a lot that won't. So by us, the legislature, not coming in and establishing reasonable rates, the cities are going to work all over the place and come up with different rates 
and it's going to it's going to it's going to cause this this program to be unmanageable at a state, at a state level but it's also going to restrict who can who can access this service and it'll be the underserved communities that'll be the first that'll be excluded because they they won't be a, be able to afford to pay for the service because the cost of placing this on the public right away is going to be prohibitive to those communities and that's your primary that's the impetus for the bill in your mind is your primary concern I want to keep it's very important for me to cut keep the costs low and and cities are you well that's our money well yeah but you what what they're doing is they're kind of uh, inserting a little hidden tax in there and saying this is going to go into our general fund and and we don't want to have to uh, vote on that or go through a process and we'd rather very quietly negotiate something that's owned by the public for the for the purpose of generating rain and I know that's going to happen and 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 that's that's just what what not passing this bill is going to translate into and and I'm very sympathetic to cities yes you know, uh, they have been, I mean, uh, I want to just associate my comments with, with, with Assemblymember Grayson. His were excellent. He, re he really pointed out a lot, of, a, a lot of real concerns that are the same ones that I share. But, you know, we passed SB1 this year, and, this, and, and the cities are going to be benefiting from the action we took. We're working on a park bond. We're doing work here to raise revenue. And we take the hard votes here, and guess who gets to spend the money? The locals. But they also need to uh, do some of that work locally, too. Okay. And, and, and I just don't support a hidden process to charge people on their cell phone for municipal services. And especially if, if you're going to have some cities charge 6000 a location or 2000 or 1000 or whatever, and some 200 now the people t paying two, uh, getting 200 for their city are, are subsidizing the municipal services for a city that they'll probably never visit across the state. And so, you know, I need your help in moving this bill forward, uh, uh, Assembly Member. It's very important to the future economy to our state. But I think we've had, we've, when, 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 when they come here and say that I haven't met with them and I haven't, that I make, I make uh, amendments to the bill without their participation, but they have never, ever presented an amendment to me in writing. And they have not ever requested amendment from me in writing. And I have gone to my mayors and I have gone to the re representatives of the opposition saying, present me your your uh, amendments and they come here and say we can do it better there's a better way this bill not ready but they will not present any amendments you you know you've been here long enough to know that that is a red flag in the business that we're in if there was a real concern they would they would be presenting amendments to me that we could discuss and I'd be glad to work with cities as I've been adding 30 amendments to this bill that we uh, since we've started and even uh, increasing the amount of revenue that they're getting We've done everything, uh, Assembly Member, and I'm still open to working with the cities to 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 address their concerns. But you know, I, I really want to work hard, and and I hope you'll back me up in drawing the line on the cost of unrolling this program. Because if we make it too expensive, it's just not going to come to underserved areas, and, and that's a fact. And Senator, uh, this is why I always support your legislation, because you're passionate and you're engaged and you have sensitivity to the local concern. 649 is not there yet for me. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens in the committee um, and uh, continue talking from there. Uh, and if it requires a further amendment to move or if you're interested in talking to me after this, I may have some suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Senator Grayson. Madam Chair, thank you again for a second opportunity here. I just, before we were to go to a vote and cast, I just wanted to clarify one more time and, and make it, because I am incredibly sensitive to local government needs. I come from that perspective from that position and uh, I come from a place that is very smart uh, they're very innovative I met with them 11 days ago and they expressed their opposition their concern my mm -hmm. my response was let me have some amendments give me some language I checked as of today and we still haven't heard back from them so uh, having said that I I, I want to state uh, once more there must be an assurance if I am to vote and move this forward to the next committee today then there has to be assurance of equitable access 
there has to be some language clarification on uh, feasible design and co-location, and there must be some addressing of language with the League of City opposition, local opposition, mm -hmm. and the understanding of what prohibition is, what's not, and uh, finding that sweet spot. Otherwise, um, I do reserve the right to vote in a different manner on the floor if it reaches me Fair. there. Fair. And this is the reason why I say this. If we stop your bill today, mm -hmm. then there is no more discussion. Yeah. We're done. Mm -hmm. But if, if we do have another committee, we do have the floor. So we have a little bit more time and a probes. So actually two more committees and then the right. floor. We actually have some time for my city that I went and visited the largest in my district to get some language in, for yep. others to get language in, for us to consider and continue to work together. Very but fair. if I see no evidence of any improvement, I will not be so supportive on the floor. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, sure. Uh, Someone member Caballero? I don't have a question, but I just want to be clear in regards to all of the comments that are being made here today is that um, is I do think there's a sweet spot. Um, and I'm, I, I understand what you're saying in regards to your, your um, disappointment that uh, the League of Cities and um, some of the other organizations haven't come to the table and said this is the language that we want. Um, I, I, I ver like very many of, of, uh, of the members here, have heard from my local electeds, uh, and they're unanimously opposed to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I need some time to be able to go home and have a conversation and really push um, some issues. Um, the issues that were that I raised before are are the issues that I'm concerned about: the feasible design, um, uh, as well as I want to make sure that we have the language in the bill that allows. Um, cities to make some decisions and they don't get sued because they did they decided to do something a little bit differently um, so I want to be able to 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 look at that but I'm gonna lay off it that doesn't mean I don't support it um, I think it needs a little bit more work if it passes out let's let's meet because I will go back to my cities and and be real specific about what kinds of things I'm looking at um, I want to be able to support it because I think you're you're uh, you're moving in the right direction. I think you you've got it right. We've got to streamline this. We just have to. Um, but it's it's I'm, I just don't feel comfortable with it right now. So, um. thank you. Second. We have a uh, motion and a second. I'd like to make a few comments, and I have. A, um, Mr. Carlson, you had a couple of items that you want to talk about on technical, I think, that were related to the amendments that were brought forward. And I want to give you the opportunity to share um, the thoughts that you had on those so we can make sure it's perfectly clear that I want to assure all of you that we have worked really hard with the author, with industry. We've asked for the league's input. We haven't, again, received any kind of amendments, even from my locals, I guess just other than oppose the bill. Um, I'm sure you have suggestions. But I want to remind you something. I fight for rural communities. I will always fight for rural communities. And right now, this is going could be a bidding war. I do not want a bidding war. So I appreciate what you've brought forward so, so far. So again, Mr. Carlson, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think what we wanted to make sure is that Again, some of the issues that, that have been that have been raised about you know the cities don't get an opportunity to, to negotiate. I think the, one of the amendments that was uh, that was taken today um, added a phrase different than as opposed to less than to the negotiation part of the bill, which was designed to open it up to say you can negotiate for whatever you want. Um, and I think that was uh, we hope that 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 does the trick. Uh, certainly, that was the intent. It was never our intent to to limit the ability to negotiate, what we wanted to do was to not be mandated to do something as part of the agreement. That was, that was and, and, and that was the reason the language in the bill was, you know, said, well, you can't require us to do that, but we never intended that to not mean that we couldn't sit there and talk, just like, you know, Sacramento and Verizon did, and they talked about, okay, well, for the, for the, uh, uh, you know, for the lower price for, you know, for the, uh, you know, for the small cells, we can do other things, and that's really what we, we want to be able to, to continue to do. Um, also, we, you know, in the uh, in the other aspect of the bill, um, that we changed the term of, from administrative fee to additional charge. There was a, a concern raised by local governments on our stakeholder meeting last Thursday, which your chief of staff and Angela um, hosted, and that was terrific to make sure that that didn't get confused with the cost recovery part of the bill. And we, we, we understood that. Um, our intent was never to have that conflated. It's cost recovery, 
plus an additional charge of up to $250, but of course the ability to negotiate in addition to that. Um, we believe that, and we've tried to put, again, the design and co-location um, conditions into the bill. It's there three times. Uh, we keep saying it, and, and, and maybe there's a better way to say it. Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, we really mean that. I mean, d and design, we think, is a, is a, is, is a really broad term. Um, design is not only what it looks like, it's what it's made out of, how it fits. Um, so we kind of thought that that might have been a, a good way. The, the word feasible is there because, well, um, it has to work. Uh, you know, we have to, our, our stuff has to work, right? So, and again, uh, some of them in Caballero was kind of getting to that and some of the size issues, I think, uh, uh, work at that. Again, the size stuff is cumulative, not, uh, not you know, the, the issue of having a refrigerator on the pole is just not going to happen. All the pictures, I think, that we provided have indicated that. So as uh, somebody, uh, Senator Wesso has indicated uh, very, very clearly, I think we've, we've tried really hard. Um, if there is something we're missing, you know, happy to talk about it. But right now we're, you know, we, you know, we think this is a, a, a pretty good proposal. Again, we'll be talking about the, the issues that uh, uh, some, of the, some of the members raised as we go forward to the next committee. And hopefully if we can do something with that, we'll, we'll try our best to do that. Probably the number one thing I got from my community was again re, uh, regarding the design review. Um, I think that's where locals have to step up. And for my small community, we have a design review process. And maybe it's time that we're going to need to go back and change some of those um, rules and regulations on design review. So I think that's something that we as locals do have some control over is that go back and, and look at your design review process. Um, I appreciate um, that all the work you've done, and um, I want to thank all of you here today for your testimony. You have came from a long distances to make sure we, you were heard, um, and we appreciate it. I want to appreciate the com committee has worked very hard on trying to make sure we make something doable. Many of you know that this is one of my most important uh, things, is to make sure that everybody has access and to close the digital divide. So thank you, Senator Huesa, for bringing this forward and agreeing to the committee amendments uh, listed on page 13 and 14. And I'd like to read those because I think some people are not aware of, of those changes. So we delete se section two of the bill, which would have required automatic renewal of permits for wireless facilities unless the facility does not meet codes and permit conditions that applied when the permit was first approved. Uh, clarified that the $250 per attachment amount is part of the rate cities and counties may charge for their use of their infrastructure and that permit fees would be separate from the $250 charge. Clarified that agreements between the local agency, a local agency and a wireless service provider can include an attachment amount that is different from the amount specified in the bill. Restore the bill's language that grandfathers existing contracts as it read leaving the Senate, Senate Governance and Finance Committee and clarify that this bill does not change the rules and compensation structure for attachments to utility poles that are owned by electrical corporations or telephone corporations. With those amendments, I will be supporting your bill today. Very well. Thank you. Would you like to close? Uh, I think everything has been said. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the bill so thoroughly and thank all of you for your comments and questions and this great process. Thank you. If this bill gets out, it goes over to telecom, communications and conveyance. And additional amendments and changes will be, could be offered there as well. Sec Secretary, call the roll. The motion is due pass as amended and we refer to the Committee on, a com on Communications and Conveyance. Aguiar Curry. Aye. Aguiar Curry, aye. Waldron. Aye. Waldron, aye. Bloom. Bloom, not voting. Caballero. Caballero not voting. Gonzalez Fletcher? Aye. Gonzalez Fletcher, aye. Grayson? Aye. Grayson, aye. Lackey? Aye. Lackey, aye. Ridley Thomas? No. Ridley Thomas, no. Vopel? Aye. Vopel, aye. Okay. Bill is out six to one. Thank you very much, everyone, and please feel free to get in contact with us. Thank you.